What was the biggest plot twist that happened in your life? Bill was a self-made millionaire by the time he was 18 years old. That was in the mid-80s. He has been one of my best and certainly most influential friends 25 years ago he married a girl that I did not like or trust point I told him as much, but he married her weird as anyways. A few years ago she ran off with a guy she met at a roller skating rink. He apparently wooed her with his zooming around or whatever and Bill was single again. He met a girl and insisted I meet her. Bill remembered that I had not approved of his ex. We met for lunch at one of those awful buffets. This girl was beautiful. She used English like a scalpel. Working on PhD. She was awesome. But I noticed little things about her. She had obviously been to finishing school. Then why did she have finger nail polish on her cuticles and a dress from a 1985 resell rack? There was just a lot of details that didn't add up and Bill was getting ready to marry her. I told Bill that I thought she was hiding something, but I didn't care. This gal was high class and high bred. I told him she was great. Bill hadn't met her parents till the wedding. It was at their beach house in Destin. It turns out that my friend hadn't told his new bride of his formidable wealth point but she had been hiding the fact that her parents are legit billionaires. Bill deserves someone like her. My mom and I haven't really had any relationship for the past 5 years for a lot of reasons, a couple of huge parts of that being my having left the religion that I was raised in and her having severe bipolar disorder that made her nearly impossible to deal with, which she refused to maintain treatment for. We have only spoken once in the last 5 years, and it was awful. It was about a year and a half ago. I drove down to see a to visit her, 450 miles from me, and tried to patch things up. It ended up in a huge blowout fight and generally went as poorly as it possibly could. We never spoke again. Point one morning in May of this year my dad showed up at my door randomly. He and my mom had been divorced for many years and said we needed to talk. The apartment building my mom was living in had been set on fire and she didn't make it out. I still can't believe how hard it hit me. It changed me, maybe forever the worst part was about 3 weeks ago, when I was trying to remember the password to an old PayPal account. I had to have it reset, and it was sent to an old ML address, that I haven't used in years. When I logged in I found an email from her, sent just shortly before she died, apologizing and trying to reconnect and make amends. We had been out of contact for so long it was the last ML address she had for me, but since I hadn't been using it for years I didn't get her message until months after her death. I met a girl through Poff and dated her for a year. She lived 6 minutes up the street from me, so we saw each other quite often. Both of us were quite introverted, so we mainly only hung out with each other. We both considered the relationship to be serious and exclusive point anyway, right from the start of the relationship, I noticed that she would text this one guy pretty frequently. I asked her about him, and she told me that he was her tattoo artist. Just to be snoopy, I checked out the website of the place she gets her tattoos done. Sure enough, there was a tattoo artist there with the same first name as the guy in her phone, but the last name was different. I asked her about it, and she quickly called me out on being paranoid, and how it was ridiculous to think that she would lie to me. I agreed, it was pretty paranoid of me. Point maybe 5 months later into the relationship, I'm on Facebook, and I decide to search the name of the guy in her phone. A profile comes up in the same small city we both live in, but there is no profile picture or anything. I decide to bring it up with her again. Because now there is two Facebook profiles, one who is actually a tattoo artist, and one who has the same name, that is in her phone. She freaks out on me for bringing it up again, and tells me that I'm crazy. I agreed, but just wanted a straight answer. She told me that I had nothing to be worried about. I apologized, and we got over at point about a year into the relationship, I found her on Poff. I would periodically go on there to see if she recreated her profile. We both deleted our profiles. I found a profile that I thought might be hers, but obviously no pictures. I catfished it, and it turned out to be her. She was back on Poff and looking for guys. I had all the evidence I needed, and I was going to confront her with it the next day and break up with her. However, I thought that if I was going to break up with her, I was going to message this Facebook profile I had found that matched the name in her phone. 
Just out of curiosity, plot twist, I message the guy. He gets back to me immediately. We converse, and it turns out that he is her boyfriend. I had been her second boyfriend the entire time. She met him two months before she met me. She bounced back between me and him for an entire year. Neither me or him knew about each other. He saw my name in her phone once, and she said that I was her tattoo artist. Every time I ever called her out, I was right. Every time she was gone mysteriously at night, she was with him. Every time she said she was hanging out with a friend of hers, she was with him. She doesn't actually have any friends. It was always him. Anyway, we both broke up with her the next morning and met the next day to have a beer. Haven't spoken with him since. I will try to keep this as short as possible. My grandfather left my grandmother for another man after 35 years of marriage and the raising of two kids, a daughter, mom, and a slightly mentally disabled son, drunkle. It messed my grandmother up pretty bad point fast forward 16 years. My mom dies from liver failure. Me and my kid sister are young and broke. Grandmother is old and broke. Grandfather pays for everything. Nobody says anything to him. No thanks, no condolences, nothing. I want to go see him and talk to him, thank him, and see how he's doing. Point I ask my grandmother where he lives, on the grounds that he told me he had something important he needed to tell me. Pulled out of my ass, obviously, but grandmother bursts into tears and confesses that grandfather is not my mum's real father. She had a whirlwind romance with some traveling jackass conman who left her as soon as he could. Grandfather offered to marry grandmother and raise my mom as his own. Mom never knew. I was stunned. My grandmother was always really judgmental of other people and looked down on anyone else in this exact situation. She was sobbing at this point and I snapped at her to stop because blood never really played all that heavily into what me and my sister considered family and that she shouldn't consider it either anyway. That's how I found out one of my family's biggest secrets on accident and then promptly didn't give a sheet point neat plot twist. Though point edit. Clarity on crazy pants familial terms. <laughs> Grew up a complete nerd. Captain of the debate team, vice president of the Spanish club, doing well in all my classes, etc. Had a pretty bad home life, though, and I had bad a pretty terrible depression. Got into Yale for college and went, expecting to finally start to break free of my depression with my newfound independence, and actually started to do better. Then one week I went through a sheety breakup, my grandfather was put in a hospital. Had a homophobic rumored say some sheety things and broke down. Ended up in a psychiatric ward. My parents were informed of the situation without my consent and had to take a lot of time away from school. The experience alienated me from a lot of friends and I had to start again as a freshman. That or when later, back at Yale, I had a friend commit suicide and I broke down again. My dean gave me poor advice in the wake of her death. And I'm now on academic probation and not allowed back to Yale. Ended up spending some time now as a bartender, waiter, etc. Was sort of expected to go to college, get my degree, get a good job, start a family, etc. But instead I'm far behind everyone else doing jobs my family think of as embarrassing, but enjoying life a bit more. Though better at the institution and wanting to finish up my college degree damn it. I'll share my grandma's, one of my favorites. As a young woman, she worked at a humble bakery in a small town in Australia. American soldiers were stationed in her town as they readied for deployment in the Pacific War of WWII. One day, a soldier from New York City came in and tried to order something not on the menu. His accent was very thick and she, being a Scottish immigrant, could not understand him. She was very embarrassed but kept trying to assist him. After a couple minutes like this, the soldier got very impatient and started cussing and insulting my grandmother, the bakery, the town, etc. Well, my grandmother, a proud woman of small stature but surprising strength, came around the counter and punched that man hard in the chest. I'm told she broke one of his ribs, but that seems extreme. She definitely knocked him over. Fellow soldiers lifted the stunned soldier off the ground and back to the base where they told their co the story. The co panicked about ruining relations with the town and pointed to the nearest man. 
he asked where he was from, Illinois, and hearing no accent, sent him back to the bakery to apologize on behalf of the army. The man did a wonderful job and made a good impression. And he went back to that town after the war. And he married my grandma and they lived happily ever after. They eventually moved back to the states, but she refused to ever visit Nick. LDR big misunderstanding leads to big love. My two closest friends, the guys I am, so close with their parents, call me son and I'm godfather to their kids, were originally the two guys that were supposed to rob me and beat me up after our initial meeting point edit for the story. So I was born in a suburb close to the big city and spent a few years there in junior school, like JK through grade 4 ish My parents had a sloppy divorce and I ended up moving with my pops back in the ghetto of my city. Long story shorter I ended up moving back to said suburb round grade 10 and coming from the ghetto I was involved with a serious drug game there and came back with delusions of being the man in this tiny little suburb I once knew. The place changed, became a major city and a lot of dudes there were in the drug game fac m though, they weren't hood like me, right? K. So to get me, I wasn't some pants sagging, loud music, bait metherfica, I wore nice clothes, pants up and deflected attention for who I really was, more stringer bell than Evan Barksdale in my movements and appearance. Again, I moved back to this place, so a bunch of kids that knew me and had fond memories of this cool kid that disappeared suddenly saw said kid again, and I basically moved back and was immediately in the biggest circles and making waves. I came back selling too and aligned with some of the heavy hitters, based on my name for those in the know and my appearance of big players in said, former, suburb providing clout. The two who became my best friends were already the biggest dealers in the school, and to them, I was some guy that showed up, acted tough, took a significant customer base, and had a bunch of the big names vouching for him, I was a weird anomaly to those not in the know, and was a realistic threat to their business my closest of the two, let's call him Marcus, he lived in the building complex behind my house and we quickly ended up chilling, smoking spliffs, etc. Little did I know he was best friend and enforcer to the main dealer, and now other best friend, let's call him Andreas Marcus was told by Andreas to get close to me, because of his in, he acted like a customer and a friend and I treated him as such. Marcus came to my house for the first time one day, we found out we had the same faked up familiar upbringing, anger issues, legal problems and moved around a lot, never really settling. We smoked a spliff in my room and Marcus asked for a bite, I told him go in my fridge, bro, little did I know that exact phrase saved me point C, as I learned, Marcus plan was, that when I was high, Marcus is huge by the way, jacked bald head faked up guy, the kind that his rip doors off hinges to get at PPL, and he asked for food, I was to leave my room, he'd search for my cash and stash in, if I caught him slash offered. Resistance he would use the asp he was concealing to bust my head open and jack me, if I died, oh well, just another drug related fuck up. But I treated him well and specifically said go in my fridge, bro and we chilled, and smoked and that was it point it wasn't until months later, that we were chilling at Andreas, and they told me, that that day the plan was to eliminate me from the game through brute force, fuck my clout and measure, they got me in my own home, the ultimate failure in that game. But I said go in my fridge, showing Marcus a trust, love and respect many never did, much less some duty more or less just met. I told him he was always welcome, and showed him love, I never usually do that, but I guess it was a real recognized real factor that had it happen point it's a good thing, that he didn't rob me at that time though. I had a loaded Taurus tucked away, which is why I can't go to my neighboring country, got snitched on and raided, again, another story, we went through way crazier with those guys since then, funniest was when a bunch of guys walked into his house, to jack a few ecstasies and wound up so faked up one was airlifted to hospital, another story though. I have one that is straight out of a faking soap opera and I'm fully ready to accept people calling bullshit on it, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. I was very good friends with a guy in high school named John, who was dating a lovely guy named Jenny, Polish or something. I can't recall, but that's sort of irrelevant, and was madly in love with him. He carried Jenny's picture around in his wallet, and every time they were together they were super sweet. Really adorable couple. 
Then, one day, Jenny starts acting really strange and distant, doesn't answer John's phone calls, doesn't spend time with us, the whole works. He flat out broke up with John and broke the poor guy's heart. I brought a spare t-shirt for a few days because my shoulder would be soaked from him crying on it. And then it got even worse point John called me one afternoon after school and begged me to come over because he needed a friend. When I got there he told me that Jenny had been killed in a car accident and he was absolutely devastated all over again. I went with him to the funeral a few days later for moral support and he was just broken. Spent a couple of weeks just moping and being depressed. And here comes the plot twist point are you ready for this sheet? He gets a faking call from Jenny. He had a twin brother that we never knew about who was apparently a big troublemaker and had been sent off to boarding school. When he'd been home to visit last they'd swapped places for some reason that I never found out. Either simply for a laugh or for some other reason I never knew, but they did. His twin was the one that had been avoiding John and broke up with him and he had been drinking and doing drugs before he got into the accident that killed him. Jenny had been off at boarding school, so he wasn't able to make it back for the funeral, and when he did get home he had to work up his nerve for a few days to tell his parents what they had done, which led to them realizing that the child they thought was dead is actually alive and vice versa, which led to some fun family complications, not the least of which being obituary retractions, headstone replacement and lots of screaming apparently. Meanwhile, John and Tim had a whirlwind romance afterwards in a giddy fit of reunited bliss, but it fizzled out after a month or so, because John was furious after the reality sank in at what Jenny had done without telling him, and letting him be so miserable all that time, not to mention letting him think that he died. Point I was the third party observer in all this, but to this day it's probably the most unbelievable thing that's ever happened in my life. Point edit, thanks for the gold. I was 15 years old in high school chemistry, talking with my teacher. I suggested we do a thermite experiment my teacher said he would, if we had the materials, and I, thinking we were having a good conversation, kept at tea with my knowledge of chemistry point. After we were done talking, some students asked me where I'd learned the stuff I'd just been talking about. I answered truthfully I'd learned it from the anarchist's cookbook. I was only in it for some fun I wanted to make some simple explosives. To blow up in my backyard point my best friend, only friend, was concerned I'd blow my arm off in the process and asked the teacher to talk to me about it after class. He did and convinced me not to try any of it. I agreed because he brought up some valid points, hurting myself on accident dangerous chemical wastes. I thought that was the end of it point a few class periods later I'm getting suspended from school for a potential bomb threat, being told they nearly called the police on me. I went from an honor roll student to suspended in 10 minutes that wasn't the plot twist, though. As my mom had picked me up from school and was telling me how wrong I was, ECT, I got a text from said friend. We couldn't be friends anymore point her mom thought I was dangerous and she was heavily emotionally dependent on her mom and so she listened to her it hid me from nowhere. I'd been friends with his girl all year I'd been there while she was struggling with her sexuality, emotional abuse from her father, or her mother alienating him from her, possibly, I'd been with her thorough the anxiety, the depression, hell, I'd sat out on my back porch and talked to her for a half hour, calming her down, after she'd cut her arms open, convincing her that it was all okay. We'd sworn we'd be friends forever, and she just left me like that, because of one mistake point I went home that night, listened to my parents punish me, no internet for two months, went into the woods with a pocket knife and thought about killing myself point I'd given so much to her I'd been with her through all that sheet and she'd just left me. I can thank my friend across town for texting me and keeping me hanging on in my darkest hour but yeah, that was the biggest plot twist of my life. I had to go back to being a loner after that, since I lost my only friend in my school district I still see this girl around school. I nod and say hi, but she never talks to me. I'm kinda angry initially I wasn't she'd be so emotionally dependent on her mom, but then I realized I was sorta of making excuses for her, since despite her emotional dependency, she has a brain of her own. Not much I can do about it, though point the sad thing I still keep her number in my phone. I'm afraid she'll fall back into depression and that she might call me on accident. 
If she does I'd talk to her and try to talk her down if things escalated that far. I really don't know how she's doing now as she sort of cut me out of her life. But if she came back tomorrow and asked to be friends I'd say yes. But I'd never trust her again. Was visiting my long distance boyfriend. Having a great time. He got the flu, and I thought that really sucked, our last week together being spent with him being too sick to get out of bed. Then two days, before I was supposed to go back to America, he lives in England, he had to be admitted to the IQ and the doctors told his dad and I that he might not make it. They said we should call any family or friends in case they needed to say goodbye. I had a flight home planned, it was the end of winter break, and I was supposed to be at college the next week, but I had always said I'd be there for him, and I faking, meant I was going to be there for him. I cancelled my flight, took leave from school, his wonderful dad let me stay at the house. I visited my partner every day, it was like a full time job. I doubt he knew I was there, but the doctor said that sometimes patients can hear you, so I had to try. I went in and held his hand and read to him until the nurses kicked me out. I usually was able to stay for an extra hour of visiting time if they had nothing they needed to do immediately. After 7 weeks he was moved to the HDU, 2 days later to the general ward, and 2 weeks later he was home. When I saw him without a ventilator connected to him, I felt like I was going to explode, I was so relieved. He said he was surprised that I didn't go back to school. I'm going to graduate a year late, but there is no way graduating on time would have been worth not being by his side. He's my partner, and I'm going to be there when he needs me. That's how it works. Oh man I'm so late for this one, but here it goes I had a huge crush on a girl from my high school, but I was so depressed, cause of my brother's cancer I didn't even want to get out of bed sometimes, so I never really felt like asking her out. But February 14th comes, and I decided to get her something point the thing is, I was so depressed, and my self esteem was so low though, that I just thought I really doubt she likes me, but I'd rather risk the embarrassment of her not liking the gift or laughing, or whatever, than her not getting anything at all. Of course she got some other gifts, but I just didn't want her to not get anything, because I really liked her, so I got her a stuffed puppy in a box with a little red bow on it. She loved it. I just gave it to her and didn't say anything, I just froze. But she hugged me and she said thank you. The best part is that when I saw her open it with her friends she had the biggest smile and hugged the puppy. I felt so damn proud of myself it's kinda sad. Lol point so after that I start talking more to her and since we were basically neighbors I started visiting her at her place. Bunch of friends were cheering for us and everything. Things were going great for like a month, then my dad got a promotion, and we had to move almost immediately. So nothing really happened, but I don't regret anything. Honestly it faking sucked when I had to move, but I'm glad I had the courage to give her the stuffed puppy, one of the best feelings in the world. I just hope I had tried asking her out before, or asked for advice. I was a very shy guy around girls. Was born prematurely by 6 weeks, because my mother was on heroin and cocaine the entire pregnancy point had a slew of developmental disabilities such as cloudy spinal fluid, crooked spinal column. Then was beaten every day from toddler to 6 years old by my mother and stepfather. She and him had 4 other children, half bothers, courts awarded my biological father custody when I was 7. In court she and my stepfather were there. She said that she couldn't believe she wasn't able to kill me when she had the chance. She even said how sorry she was to all those in court that she actually gave birth to such a vile child that would say lies to the court point I was learning to walk again after being struck repeatedly along my spine so actually since I was unable to speak well I had to draw it. My father still has it, it was of me over the knee of a stick figure with fire in his hands hitting me. Learned that two years ago he resisted arrest and was shot by police point before that all my half bothers are in jail for domestic abuse or theft point she called me last year and was telling me how sorry she was. I told her that losing me was the best thing she ever did as a mother. Even through all the sheet she did and caused I was happy with the outcome and so should she. Then hung up point somehow she is dying of heavy metal poisoning point proof that product of your environment is bullshit. I have a 6 year old son now, and he was asking about his great grandmother. 
I explained it to him. Best I could, and his face said it all point he gave me a big hug, and said I was the best daddy he ever had, lol that felt good. I win by default. I never really knew my father growing up. Sadly, he lived right next door for most of my adolescent life. There is exactly one time I remember him acknowledging me. I was standing on my front porch, and he was going up the steps and into his. I was a kid. I waved. He waved back. That is the only contact I remember w slash my father as a child point still though, I've always wondered about him. It hasn't really ever been about anger or anything, but more so why he chose not to want me. I've wondered about him for over 15 years way back in the day they released a bike called the Sonic 6. It was a glorified Huffy W slash a big blue shield on the front and a gear stick in the dead center to change gears. I got it for my birthday and of course I was ecstatic. That thing was so bad as. As luck would have it, as I was riding W slash a friend a guy walking past me the opposite way cold cock me and knocked me straight off the bike. I got sucker punched, like you wouldn't believe. The dude was huge. Like obese huge. I was a kid, how powerful was I? The guy simply jumped on my brand new bike, told me to stay down and pedaled off. I chased him, but I didn't get very far. He was gone in a flash 15 years later I learned that my real father had paid that guy to beat me up and steal my bike as a revenge tactic against my mother. I mean, what kind of person does that? What kind of father does that? Sat, really point at it, another tad bit I wanted to throw in. I mentioned how the dude decked me and just rode off w slash the bike. Multiple sources had confirmed that he actually paid the dude to beat the sheet out of me. Like, hit me while I'm about out for the count type of thing. The guy used to hang out w slash his friends right across the street. A few weeks after my bike was stolen they started riding it up and down the street in front of me, except they had broken off the left hand side of the handlebars. I remember the shield used to flap back and forth as they went flying down the street on it. How's that for some bullshit? My life has had a lot of plot twists. My biggest one is probably my dad committing suicide when I was 9. 9 years ago point honestly my childhood was sheet after the age of 9. Now I completely accept the fact about it and I understand there is people that have it worse out there and so I avoid talking about my situation unless we get into deep conversation and I trust you enough point my mom had been addicted to meth since she was 13 and had me at the ago of 17, but thankfully stayed away from drugs while pregnant with me. When she had me, my mom's parents took me over and raised me until 6. My mom cleaned up a bit and had my half-brother and sister, but they stayed with her, so I lived as an only child. My dad and stepmom, evil woman, took custody and took them away from the only life I knew. I lived with them and my two other brothers until I was 8 and my dad and stepmom got a divorce, lived with my dad and his best friend for a few months before he got a new girlfriend and we moved in with her, she cheated on him with his best friend and he committed suicide. I was visiting my grandma and brother and sister and she got a phone call and started crying. Few days later we were at my dad's funeral point first funeral I've ever been to and it was my dad's. My best friend, the guy I went to for everything, was gone point I finally was told everything a few years ago. While my dad's girlfriend is now my aunt, she married his brother and they have two kids. My brother and sister now live with my mom's dad, my two brothers on my dad's side, live three hours away in the city, and my mom now has three of my brothers. I've only officially lived with two of my brothers for two years. I know live with my dad's parents, and I've been through depression, anxiety attacks, nightmares for about 5 years, and now I'm attending college, have one of the best relationships I've ever had, but I still live in a bit of a shell. I'm still working on it, and it would be easier if I did have my father, but I've done good with everything on my own. I worked in morning radio, and I was also an accomplished bowler one day I mentioned something about a high score I had, and a listener called in a challenge me, because he had just bowled a perfect game the week before point we worked out the details, and since we had the same first name I said loser has to legally change their name for one year to whatever the winner wanted. We had an attorney ready to donate the time for the paperwork. The guy refused to agree to those terms. He was up for anything, but wouldn't do the legal name change. 
so we decided to do loser gets it to two of the winners choosing. My idea was better, but I digress, so the challenge was set, one game the next day for the tattoo. Our studio was next to a bowling alley, so we were able to set it up, so that we started in the studio in the first hour of the show. Bowled in the second hour, and got the tattoo in the third hour. I designed my tattoo, and got it to an artist, she made a stencil, so she could tattoo fast, and make for better radio point I threw the first 9 strikes in a row. He missed a spare in the first, I didn't even finish the game. I would have had somewhere between a 269 and a perfect game. He couldn't score higher than 200 point, so we go and get the tattoo on this guy like 10 minutes after I embarrassed him on live radio. The tattoo is me riding Falca, I green screened myself in the Atriu pose and photoshopped me into the actual movie poster. The artist had a perfect stencil made. The tattoo is finished, and the detail is unbelievable. We all have a great laugh and I only see this guy one other time in my life point plot twist the last I heard he was in jail for rapping a 13 year old, his second rap conviction, he couldn't legally change his name because he was a registered sex offender, so there is a child rapist in prison somewhere with a tattoo of me riding Falker on his bicep point I'm the only person in the world with that story. Earlier this year I went to the doctor to get some medication for my acne as my skin had been really bad. For the medication I was going to go on I had to take a pregnancy test. No worries there, as I was on birth control, or so I thought point the pregnancy test came back positive, but I was so convinced it was wrong I honestly didn't care too much at that point. After a few blood tests, to try and see how far along I was it looked like I was miscarrying. The hormone levels were all over the show and now where they should be for early pregnancy. The doctor ordered a scan and I went along fully prepared to see an empty uterus and be told I had miscarried. At the scan they found that I wasn't miscarrying and that I was actually 27 weeks and 5 days. That's like 6 months pregnant point obviously I was pretty shocked. Honestly I almost passed out and vomited. I just didn't know how to process that information. Luckily my boyfriend was with me, and somehow managed to calm me down. We talked about it, and decided that neither of us were ready to be parents. Obviously at that late stage in pregnancy there wasn't a choice of terminating, but we decided we'd adopt point a week or two later I woke up with cramps so went down to the air just to check things out. Sitting in the waiting room I felt a sensation like my water's breaking, but when I looked down it was all blood. After being rushed into surgery and multiple blood transfusions later I woke up to the doctors telling me that I had a little girl and that she was fine point she was kept in the coup for 8 weeks which gave us enough time to get our heads around everything and decide that we couldn't give her up. Now she's a little happy 6 month old and my life is completely different. TLDR went to the doctor for some acne treatment, told I was pregnant and had a baby 2 weeks later. Grew up on a conservative Christian homeschool compound. Lived my whole life to make my parents happy. At 15 my older brother tried to rap me, so I went to the authorities for help, and my parents kicked me out because they didn't believe me and said I was tearing the family apart. Fast forward through the next 4 years of acting out while living on my own and battling mental illness. I had a sugar daddy who was helping pay my bills and self esteem was at an all time low. Flew from my home on the west coast to the east coast on a whim and met a brown eyed guy in the rain at an outdoor concert at RFK Stadium in DC. Lost each other in the crowd and found each other later in the crowds on the escalators down to the metro. Subway tunnel. Our first date the next day was driving up to John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore where his two year old son was battling an allergic reaction to anti rejection meds for a heart transplant. At some point between reading Dr. Seuss and sharing Takiyo with his dad, I fell in love with both of them. They saw in me what I could not see in myself. Their love made me realize I was worth more than my body, such abuse survivor's belief, and that I had value as a loving, caring human being. I got home to the west coast and called my dad, breaking down in tears on the phone and explaining that I needed help transitioning to an honest job. He helped pay my rent while I searched for work and took a job at a call center. It was a rough transition, making in 40 hours of being screamed at on the phone what I would in one weekly lunchtime visit. 3 years have now passed and I have worked full time, 
put myself through school and am now a certified welder in a union doing construction work and making more money than I ever dreamed of. All because some people loved me and saw in me what I didn't know I had. I once was crying to a friend about how the long distance thing failed and how it didn't work out with my love, but she got a twinkle in her eye and said, oh, but it did work out. It really did, and I thank the forces of the universe that got me this far. Met this great gal, all kinds of coincidences lining up, work at the same place, same hours even, which no one had, 2 to 10 was a weird one. Turns out we live in the same exact apartment complex 30 minutes across town, big city, really random that it's same complex, even described it same way, and had a moment of wait. Great connection, felt like this awesome kindred spirit, rare, had fell into my path, seemed like a sign of something. I mean, you never know, but so many things lining up, means something, right? You hear so many stories of things, that were meant to happen. Harry Potter Midnight was great, she didn't know anyone to go with yet, she was going to go alone, then the next week her car's in the shop, I offer her a ride home, same apps and all. She decides to bike it get an extra hour of work, so I tell her about the handy shortcut that cuts most of the way from the bus she goes the way I said, and is killed, while crossing the street by a drunk driver going 75 in a 35 zone. Not even 150 yards from where I live. I don't know if it shouldn't, but it still boggles my mind. All these things lined up in such an unusual way to have this person in my life's path. And then that happens not only at all, but right in where I live and because, indirectly, of something I said. What does that even mean? I feel like I just can't believe in God or destiny or fate or anything after that. A burden. I'll try to make this quick point be me 17 years old, practicing martial arts, after doing nothing for 6 months, get unwell mid class twice, dizzy and after that, vomiting, go to cardiologist, pressure is fine, request such a cardiogram, ultrasound of the heart, and it says I have a slightly thicker ventricular septum, the muscle wall between the ventricles. Nothing that would be clinically important. Be me relieved point be me 20 years old, routine cardiologists check up, for I want to lift heavy objects against the gravity, aka bulk. Cardiologist sees old echocardiogram, and says it's nothing, and requests new echocardiogram and an ergometric, running while connected to electrodes implanted in my chest to check for heart electrical activity during stress. He also says I have a heart murmur. Go to a cardiogram. Doctor doing it said I have neither a thickened ventricular septum nor any murmur whatsoever. Eco is more sensitive and specific a test than a doctor's ear. Be relieved 2.0. Do ergometric and there's something weird on it. Says I might have arrhythmia, but unlikely due to age. And being a symptomatic point go back to cardiologist. He looks at eco and says good, you're fine. Then he looks at Ergo, stops for a second, gets a book out of the shelf and shows me a heart as big as a bull's, and says my heart is like this. Says I have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that it's genetic, that I shouldn't go to the gym or lift heavy objects like grocery, yes, he said that. I ask if I have a decreased life expectancy. He hesitates and says no. I ask about risks. He says let's not talk about risks, and adds I advise you not to look anything up on the internet. Just do what I says, and you'll be fine. Get to my car, try not to cry, cry a lot, go home, check the internet, see I have a high risk for sudden death. Get scared as fact point called ad to make an appointment with his cardiologist, who is a famous expert. Go there, apprehensive as fact, new cardiologist checks everything. Says I'm most likely okay, definitely don't have anything that can cause sudden death, requests new ergometric to check. Do ergometric, it comes back negative. It was all due to a false positive. I have nothing. Be me relieved 3.0 point sorry, I failed in making a short story. I grew up an extremely fat lazy kid and I dropped out of a great college freshman year and joined a factory. I thought that was going to be the end of life working, that job until I eventually retired and had a kid. This was until I was laid off from the job on my birthday the week full registration ended. I decided that day to get a degree with the hopes of eventually traveling the world, so I went back to college at a community school while also working out. 
to get in shape from 340 pounds and paid off all debts. I have so far, in 6 months, SS lost 110 pounds, ran a marathon, got a license and a car, moved into my own apartment, got my passport, and am now officially accepted in the spring semester of college into a well-known electrical engineering program. My entire life changed drastically from something that happened on one day. I know exactly when that day was I'm amazed on how fast your life can change for the positive and this gives me hope for the rest of my life that anyone at any time can change their life for the better if they are willing to be disciplined enough to put in the effort. I have the goals of backpacking this entire summer in Europe but I can't believe anymore that the more likely story of my life several months ago would have been still working a dead end job living with my parents all while being a 340 plus pound slop with nothing good going for me at all. If anyone is in a similar situation just know that life can change for the better at any instant. I was 19, a year after I moved into Perth from my family's home in the country. Just recently secured a shared rental and found a steady full-time job in a warehouse, all set to start saving to go overseas for the first time. One day during a normal work day I sit down to have my lunch break and pull my phone out of the backpack I took to work. Had a sheet load of missed calls from my mum and a text telling me there's an emergency and to call her back. I call her and she's in tears. She says my aunt is on the way to my workplace to take me to the hospital where my mum just had an unrelated back surgery and that I absolutely mustn't drive myself there. She won't tell me what's happened but I finally get her to say that it's about my brother. By this time my blood has turned to ice and all the colour gone from my face. I tell the boss I have to leave, clock out and wait out the front for my ride. I call my mum again trying to get more information, she keeps saying it's too terrible for her to say. Finally she puts her dad on the phone, and with difficulty he tells me my brother has passed away. He can't tell me anymore, so I end the call, and wait with my mind racing, and stomach churning point my aunt and uncle arrive, and I immediately ask what's happening. My aunt says my 15 year old only brother has hung himself. Three years later my blood still runs cold typing this out. Our family is no stranger to mental issues. My dad attempted suicide twice, somehow this didn't drive him to another attempt. I still live in fear that it might yet happen. My adolescence was defined by debilitating anxiety, OCD and depression. My brother was similar to me in so many ways, and we'd seen signs that he might develop similar issues. But no one saw any cause to worry much, if anything he seemed to be happier than ever. I still can't believe he's never coming back. I've had so many dreams where he's appeared, and I run to hold him, and try to pull him back into reality. But it'll never happen. I've posted elsewhere about why I worry, that I'm the reason he killed himself. Point my dad went from a traumatic childhood with a horrible family, to a shitty working class career to having a troublesome elder son and now a dead youngest one. And all he's ever wanted was to love his family and be loved back. It really does feel like there's a curse over us. If I ever find myself face to face with a god, I'm tearing that evil cunt's colon out through his chest. And if I ever meet the kids who bullied my brother and they aren't racked with guilt, I'm turning them into a bloody paste. I hate myself for not hospitalizing them when I was still in school. My parents divorced while I was pretty young. Years later while my brother, sister, and I were playing in our backyard DHS showed up to take us away from my mother because the daycare discovered that my younger sister had been being physically abused. She was two at the time. While the trial ensued, it came forth that my sister's father was hitting her not my mother. Anyways normally when children are taken away from their custodial parent they will go to the other parent. I remember staying with my father for about a week, then moving into my grandmother's house. I did not realize what was going on at the time as I was only in the first grade. I just enjoyed the time I got to spend with her. A year later my mother wins her case and gets custody of us again. Point here is the twist. Fast forward 12 years, I think about the events that happened while I was taken from my mom. It turns out my father was knee deep in meth and the 16 year old he was banging at the time, so he sent us away with no thought. I was destroyed for the longest time. I hated him for it and it still lingers in the back of my head. Now he is a completely new man who had custody of my for younger siblings, and is finally making something of his life. 
One day I might me, and to speak my mind, but now is not the time. In high school there was a boy I saw pretty frequently, as he shared a locker with an acquaintance of mine. We never spoke until he overheard a conversation I was having with a friend about Call of Duty. I'm a girl, but then we became good friends over our mutual love for video games he was always hilarious, but since he was also very flamboyant I thought that he was closeted gay, and that even he may not even know it himself. At the time I had a boyfriend, my first love, and I didn't find my friend physically attractive in the slightest. As my relationship began to go downhill due to the fact I slowly found out I was actually dating a lying, cheating as whole, our friendship grew. I always came to him for advice, and he never judged me or my boyfriend. It became clear he began to have a crush on me, and I reciprocated, but he was extremely careful to never cross boundaries of my relationship. After my breakup, my friend and I dated for about two weeks, but I simply wasn't over my ex. No hard feelings over our own breakup, though, we remained close friends my friend, and I had a small falling out later down the line, and stopped talking for a few months, but when we reconnected, it was like nothing changed. A few months into it, we began dating. We've been together for two years now, and still going strong. I think he's the most handsome man in the world and we have a great such life. I still joke with him that I'd be heartbroken if wakes up one day and realizes he's gay. He's still the funniest guy I know, and we love playing video games together. He is the epitome of a perfect so, and I genuinely believe he's the love of my love and my future husband. TLDR, my best friend in high school that I thought was secretly gay turned out to be the straight love of my life. I got rear-ended by someone who admitted that it was his fault, but when I went through all the appropriate channels with the insurance and the recommended panel beaters, he said it was too expensive and refused to pay. Well, he starts yelling profanities at me on the phone before he refuses to pay. Like I had any input on their pricing lol point anyways my car get fixed and my insurance takes him to a small claims court. The dude doesn't show up. Yay win point he then applies for a rehearing. So I needed to have a hearing about the application for a rehearing. On the date itself, he immediately admits the fault, but contests the pricing of the fix, and had a very weird and awkward circular argument with the referee about how he should've had some input in the panel beaters we chose, and how he cold found much cheaper Asian panel beaters that could produce the same kind of quality. The guy was an old Asian fella that needed a translator, I mentioned too, so the whole process took twice as long, with the referee entertaining him thoroughly and explaining to him exactly why the insurance company had no obligation to let him choose the panel beaters anyways it had been two years since the accident. He first said he doesn't have insurance, but in the end it was revealed that he did in fact have insurance. He thought the damage on my car was minimal and would have been under the amount of his excess that he would have paid. That was also one of his circular arguments that it should have been cheaper and under the amount of his excess. Why he thinks that I have no clue point so, after about an hour and a half of his arguments being torn to shreds, he finally accepts that he will have to pay the full reasonable amount to my insurance company. The insurance representative from my side advised him that, even though we had to go through this whole court system, he can actually still go back to the insurance company that he was with, regardless of whether or he is still currently with them, and pay the excess instead of the total amount needed to fix my car. For good measure, she asked him what company he was with point turns out he had the same insurance company I did. The look on the rep for the insurance company was priceless. The dude had been fighting his own insurance company over the span of two years, costing me days of work and taxpayers money faking sigh. During the middle of fourth year of college, I was flunking out, three year suspension, and I didn't tell anybody. I came back to my apartment after Christmas break dejected, not sure what to do with my life, and what the hell am I going to tell my parents when I don't enroll in the spring semester. Anyway, I got a letter from my school, which would say I was suspended and not able to enroll in the spring semester. I opened the letter to... Congratulations for getting off of academic probation what? 
It turns out that one of my professors that I assumed was going to fail me, I only took the first test, which was nearly an MTSA exam. Embarrassed, I didn't come back after that, and yes I was immature, actually put an I, incomplete, instead of an F which put my overall GPA to exactly a 2.0, and off probation. I cried for nearly an hour, and took it as a sign to finish my degree. It took a year and a half to finish, but I did get it done. Sure my GPA was not pretty, 2.3, and my job has nothing to do with my degree, but good I have a degree. I never did thank that professor, or ever spoke to him about removing, that I which did eventually turn to an F like I said I was immature, but thank you Dr. Cleaver for not failing me. My life is so much better, now that I could imagine what would have happened, had I failed out. As I grew up in a Christian household, mainly my mom. My dad tried, but eventually went back to not caring. I felt my family was invincible. Like God is always watching and keeping us out of harm's way. I felt protected. A couple years ago my parents divorced, and my dad moved in with some friends and I stayed with my mom and my sisters. I was sad, because my dad was an awesome man. He had his issues though. Alcoholism, bipolar, depression, paranoia, etc. But he always put me, and my sisters above all. Sometime late last year my mom remarried. My dad became more depressed, and he drank some more. Earlier this year things were starting to get better though. My dad was looking for a job, he was finally trying to stop drinking, and was trying to find a girlfriend. I got a call from him earlier this year, and it was great hearing from him. Told him how we are doing, and how our stepdad is taking good care of us, and how we miss him and such. He talked to my little sister too. It was a change from the point where he was drinking and depressed because he would call and blame my mom for things and a lot of negativity. It was good to hear something good for once. Then the next week he died the night before his birthday. Heart failure or something like that. Ever since then my closeness to religion has been fading and I feel more vulnerable than ever. My birthday is coming up and it makes me sad that he is no longer here to see me get older or my sisters. Probably not the biggest plot twist, but a good notable one from recent memory. About 3 weeks ago I finally got a job, after moving from Idaho to Florida, to be with my girlfriend. I was really excited about the job, because it was similar to what I was already doing before, and paid a little less than what I was getting before. Anyway I ended up not getting the job, because I apparently lied on my application about my criminal history point my brother had a dog that got loose and a cop was nearby, and he pepper sprayed the dog, and registered it as a vicious dog at large. My brother was only 17 at the time, so I didn't want him to get a ticket, so I took it for him, he's always getting into trouble with the law, and didn't want him to get it any worse point anyway, the place I got the job at had apparently asked if I had any misdemeanors or felonies which is new to me, because every place I've applied it just asks for felonies. I was pretty devastated, because I had been looking for a job for 3 weeks already. I was really pissed off at my brother, and felt helpless and stupid, that I didn't read two simple works on the application point, but the plot twist comes in, and as it turns out, last week I got a better paying job doing much better work and actually thank my brother for what he did for me, and what I did for him. I hate the saying things happen for a reason, but I guess in this case, they do. I'm pretty late into here, and will probably get buried point this is not my story. This is taken from you slash for folks sake story on r slash tifu like a lot of people on tifu this fuck up did not happen to me today, rather it happened quite a long time ago, when I was 11. I was a nerdy kid, and in my first year of middle school I got picked on. Nothing too crazy, but it affected my self esteem for sure. What made matters worse for me was this girl in my year, let's call her Beth had a crush on me. Beth was a little off, more than a little off really, and she was very vocal and persistent about her feelings for me. I really wanted her to stop, but 11 year old me couldn't muster up the courage to just tell her that all I wanted was for her to leave me alone. I tried to drop hints, be passively sheety to her, avoid her at all costs, but she was not picking up what I was laying down. Well one day me and Beth are in the first period math we share together. Beth's sitting next to me, and I'm doing my best to ignore her, and do my math homework. 
Beth, incensed by this, reaches over and starts tugging on my mechanical pencil. Now it's early, I'm not a morning person, and I'm pretty done with Beth's sheet, so I start trying to yank the pencil out of Beth's grasp. Remember how I said Beth was persistent? She refuses to lose this tug of war and we start yanking this pencil back and forth, until I decide to just let go. Big mistake. Beth stabs herself right in the goddamn face, the eyebrow to be specific. The blood came pretty quick, and Beth starts screaming he stabbed me. The teacher comes over, whisks Beth to the nurse's office, and tells me to stay right there. The intervening 5 minutes between the teacher's departure and return were some of the worst of my young life. The whole class is whispering and pointing and laughing. All I can think is about my father's reaction when he gets word that I stabbed a girl in the face and how no one is going to buy that I only kinda sorta stabbed her. The teacher returns and begins to write the angriest looking referral I've ever seen in my entire life when another teacher enters the room and tells her to turn on the TV. The first plane had hit the towers, the newscasters are saying it must have been an accident and then boom the second plane hits. It's 9 faking 11. I'll be honest I thought oh good. They forgot all about me. I didn't even get a referral point DLDR accidentally stabbed a girl in the face, saved from punishment by Osama Bin Laden. I had a traumatic memory as an infant, age of 1 and a few months. I can very barely remember being buckled into a red car, my mother's car, as someone, my biological father, that I didn't know about, is screaming and pounding on the car, and then tearing out of the driveway 11 years later, I was in the same car outside of the same house and I had some crazy deja vu, and recognized the man that my mother was speaking to as the biological father I had never met slash been told about. I had been seeing him for years once every 6 to 8 months for the rare child support he paid. I was always told he was a friend of my mother's. It was until I was in the back seat of the car fiddling with my seat belt and looking up at the house that I inherently realized who he was and had vivid flashbacks of his face and his voice. I then realized what was going on, as well as realizing my stepfather was not my birth father side note slash fun memory with this. I always thought of my stepfather as my real father that even years after knowing my real father, full knowledge, age of 16 at the time, that when me and my stepfather visited the doctor for me at one point, the doctor asked me if I had a history in the family of any heart issues, I know my stepdad had severe issues in the family. When the doctor left the room I got mad at my stepdad asking why he didn't tell the doctor, I was worried I could have it, and I was incredibly worried that, because the doctor didn't know it would be missed. It wasn't until later, that night that I remembered he didn't mention it, because duh he isn't related to me. I felt bad for pestering him about it, and found it strange how he never said the words we aren't related he just simply responded with don't worry about it. Keep in mind I basically just forgot he was my stepdad. When my best friend and I were entering second year of high school, she and her mother were having increasingly volatile fights. I knew her for 3 or 4 years by now, and I was a second child to the home, so I didn't see these behaviors as abnormal, just whoa girl, your mom is being so weird today. Hoarding wasn't something we knew about, but it was very typical of us to have to clear the couch off to watch TRL and navigate these tall hallways of beans from space to space. Her mom works for a lawyer, so they were all the files and sheet. We didn't question at point her dad left when she was a toddler and never laid child support. She shared pictures of what her mom looked like after he left. Bruises, gashes. She constantly put it in her head that they were on the brink of eviction, so she couldn't have certain things. She would be grounded for throwing away trash or wearing flip-flops while riding her bike. It was madness. Finally her older sister, 6 years older, reached out to the father. She had moved out of the home during college and her health issues disappeared. She suspected her mother had been poisoning her for years. She wanted to get her sister out. Father flies up for a week. They meet secretly. He's a successful lawyer. He has paid child support her whole life. The abuse was documentation following a car accident for litigation purposes. Her whole life was a lie. That week they plotted. My friend decided to become emancipated and move immediately across the country to live with her father. 
we picked her up for school and drove her to her dad. When she didn't come home, she called the police. Told them she is drug addled and unstable and they have to find her. We get questioned by the police without our parents present as to her whereabouts and we lied because her mother is that scary 15 years later. She is better adjusted. Her mom did some damage to her and living in a new city. Her mom is still in my city and last I heard, she contacted her daughter saying she had terminal cancer and they needed to come home. They called the doctor, family friend, she cited as her provider for the care and he let them know she had the flu last week, but, no, not cancer tldr friend's mom was a hoarder with munchaws and by proxy who poisoned her sister and led them to believe their father was a deadbeat. My dad didn't come home when he was supposed to, so we called highway patrol, assuming the worst. My mom honestly thought he was hurt or dead. The officer goes one of the detectives wants to speak with you. Plot twist. My dad was in suicide watch at the prison for robbing a bank, leading the cops on a high speed chase, and then threatening to shoot himself. He hasn't ever been in trouble with the law. We found out he was doing meth. Then bad shit happened, because we lived in such a small town. We were broke and no one wanted to hire my mom or me because of my dad. People gave me a lot of sheet at school and my mom got a lot of looks when we went out in public. My younger brother and sister had it the worst though. I tried to slam my car into a pole a few times because everything felt so hopeless. I couldn't go to college. My grades started going down and I was so scared of not graduating and inevitable homelessness for me and my family that I tried to hang myself in the girl's bathroom with a belt at school. After seeking some psychological help, I'm a lot better. I graduated and moved away with my family. We are still kinda poor, but we are doing a lot better financially and mentally. Sorry for the pandering. It just affected me a lot. Point TLDR father presumed dead, actually got high on meth, and robbed a bank. I was born Mormon, and taught it was the only true church my whole life. At one point I became very devout, did everything possible, was super Mormon, and ended up going to serve a Mormon mission in Salt Lake City, Utah, of all places. I thought this mission was going to be amazing. Everyone thought I was going to be one the top missionaries nope turns out the head leader, known as the mission president, decided he didn't like me. I spent 9 months being targeted, 1 out of 40 other girls. He emotionally slash verbally abused me and 2 others he set me up with and convinced every leader possible that I was a troublemaker, disobedient, and worst of all crazy. No one believed me, but this one woman and a handful of others who couldn't protect me. Everyone around me was convinced I was a problem 220 missionaries in that mission rumoring about me because they believed their leader, who they thought was called of God, and he's using them against me. I go home, develop severe PTSD, major depression, suicidal thoughts, do everything I can to move forward, lose all my friends, lose myself, and 3 years after the fact, when I got no help from the Mormon church, hit rock bottom way too many times, and had nowhere else to go but a date I set out to kill myself, when a single thought entered my mind, that maybe the Mormon church wasn't true. Scariest thing ever, because as Mormons you're taught the world is evil and anything bad about the Mormon church is from Satan. I hesitantly start researching the church, and plot twist find out in 2 hours the church was founded by a con man, and has been lying to its members since it started. Damn point I was out in 3 weeks. I struggled, lost a ton of friendships, everyone thinks I'm deceived now, and I'm finally getting back up on my feet, literally barely, I have $30 to my name, and all the confusion about my mission president getting away with the abuse is gone. Now I just think he's a huge douchebag, and someday I'd love to sue his ass. This is my grandma's, but it's too good not to share point I want to preface this by saying that the grandma in this story is my mum's stepmom and is 57 years old, not old enough to biologically be my grandmother, but I've known her my entire life, so my grandma has known her entire life that she was adopted, but was never given any information on her birth parents, a choice her adoptive parents made early on. She always wondered about her biological parents, but wasn't able to start research until a year ago, when her adoptive mother passed away, and she had access to the documents. 
she found out her birth mother's name and started doing some research online to try and locate any family members. Adoption in Canada wasn't super organized back then and there wasn't much information. She had her birth father's first name, but not his last, the name of the adoption agency, no longer in existence, and an old address plot twist. After almost a year of research turning up nothing she was feeling ready to give up, when a few weeks ago she found her birth mother's name in a voting register from decades ago, which included an address. When she looked up the address, the person living at the house had her mother's surname. Turned out the guy living there is her first cousin. Her birth parents eventually married, but had no other children. Her biological mother passed away from cancer in the late 80s, but her father is still alive, and they met up last week. He never wanted to give her up, but her mother insisted, because it wasn't socially acceptable to have a child out of wedlock. He is 85, she is 57, and they are finally building a father-daughter relationship. This might be a bit long, but it was profound. I was married to a mentally ill and violent woman. I won't get into all of the details, but what led to our finally leaving was when I found out she had called child services and claimed I had been abusing my child. They kept scheduling visits on my day off according to her. Then they'd show up and she'd tell them I left and refused to meet with them. I had no idea this was happening. Then one night she tells me. Very smug. She's proud that she has faked me over. I begin to raise my voice and yell. I never played a hand on her, but she called the cops and claimed that I had. I was arrested for disturbing the peace. Spend the night in jail. Stayed with family. I was forbidden from contact her or my kids until we had court 8 days later. We get to court and in my state all family cases had to go to a mediator. They asked us who wanted to go first. She jumped up and ran in. She was in there for 4 hours. When she came out, and it was my turn she whispered to me as she walked by I faked you good. She was smiling and happy, and I was in fear that I would lose custody and visitation of my children. I get in the room, and not only is the mediator there, but so is the caseworker from child services I had been blowing off point. Before I could say a word the caseworker said sir, either you take custody of your children, or they go to foster care. But we will not allow them to go home with her. Turns out the caseworker checked with my job and found out I was scheduled to work every one of those dates I missed. They took my kids to the doctors and not only found no signs of abuse, they flat out said I never did and only said it before because their mother told them they had to. I was granted immediate temporary custody of my kids. My now ex turned on the theatrix in court screaming that we were stealing her children. My kids came home with me that night, and until my daughter left for college have lived with me, and me alone, since that day point in another plot twist, after an 18 month divorce where I finalized my having sole custody, she died 5 weeks after. She was trying to cheat me out of child support that was being garnished from her paycheck. So she found a food truck, all cash business. It broke down on the highway late at night and a drunk driver struck, and killed her tldr crazy ex-wife. I suppose the three main ones would be, one when I was a kid not really knowing it at the time, why we had to move from Venezuela to USA and leave a perfect life with lots of friends. Turns out my family was fired while on vacation, basically for no reason at all. That's kind of a long story. I got used to being on my own, but the teen years were a really dark time for me. It didn't help when mom went into a coma and she didn't file to renew our visa so once she was better, I guess, though diagnosed with lupus, we had to move back to Venezuela. Trust me, this country is really difficult. It really wasn't after so many years that it took to grow up, I didn't see how hard my mother worked. She had a job at McDonald's in USA and sometimes came home with burns. She would clean and cook and take care of me. Sometimes she had a second job, mostly babysitting. And once we got back to VNZ. She worked all day teaching and had to do so much work when she got back home on top of the cleaning and cooking. Lastly, I eventually realized how much she loved me and how loyal she was when a boy broke my heart. Three months after the peak of my life, she died. Got sick and it worsened because of her immune system the doctors here didn't even know what to do. That's it so far, I'm not so old to have more I guess. 
I'm late but here's mine. Moved to Oklahoma in August 2012. Met and started dating a guy who went nuts on me when we broke up. Got a restraining order in April 2013 point met and started dating a guy in June 2013. We were together until November 2014, sharing an apartment, a dog, a cat, and working on building a life together. I'm still not sure why he ended things, but oh well. I was in the process of dismissing the restraining order against my ex and have a feeling that had something to do with it. Anyway, he moved out and kept the animals in January 2015 the ex I had a restraining order against reached out to me on OkCupid. We ended up starting to see each other again up until April 2015 when he attacked me, beating me and choking me unconscious twice. I moved back to my home state for a short time while he deals with court stuff and ended up in a long distance relationship with a friend of mine who had helped me through the domestic violence stuff. In June 2015 I was in a single car Oliver accident where my car rolled four and one half times and I was partially ejected and pinned under my car. By some god a miracle I walked away with scratches, scrapes, and a dent in my forearm from where the door frame was pinning it to the ground point my boyfriend drove from Oklahoma to my home state overnight to make sure I was okay and returned to visit again in August 2015. He proposed and I said yes. I moved back to Oklahoma and we've been living happily since. So for most of my life I was a pretty normal kid. Did well in school, had lots of friends, involved in lots of activities, even crushed on a guy or two. That last part is actually pretty relevant. Throughout middle school and the beginning of high school more and more of my friends were beginning to date, pair up, etc. Now, myself being a young teen I knew all about relationships, slash s, but there were two things that always confused me. 1. Why people would cheat on their significant others and 2. Why people would have sex before marriage when they knew they could get pregnant. There were a few pregnancy rumors floating around school. Fast forward to sophomore year of high school. I was at a party with girls and one boy who we all suspected was gay but wasn't out yet. It was 2am so we were of course discussing love and romance. We went around naming our male and female celebrity crushes, mine were I think Tom Hiddleston and Scarlett Johansson, when one of my female friends said something along the lines of, oh my god there are so many hot celebrities I wanna have sex with all of them followed by a chorus of approval from my other friends and that was how I learned people actually wanted to have sex with each other. Plot faking. Twist point I was extremely befuddled. I asked all my friends at the party, wait, you actually want to have sex? To which they responded, um, of course. Do you not? For years I thought sex was just something people did to have kids and only to have kids, and that people were joking when they said they wanted to fuck, and that hot and sexy were just ways of saying extra extra cute, not completely different concepts. Most laughably I thought there was only so much sex in movies and on TV, because sex sells and they were using it to make more money. It was like my entire faking world turned upside down, but suddenly everything made sense. I spent about a year being confused as hell, trying to figure out what it meant to be sexually attracted, turned on, etc. I asked a lot of personal questions unfortunately, before I figured out asexuality was a thing and my life straightened out again. Point TLDR, learned people wanna fuck. Mind blown. Throw away because I can't have my main account compromised, but this is going to get buried anyway so, was definitely coming off one of the best years of my life in my junior year in high school where I maintained a 3.8 GPA plus, while taking 4 app courses, playing football, volunteering at a soup kitchen and other places, and doing extracurricular activity group work. Had a solid relationship with the love of my life at the time, and had a great set of friends that I'd take a bullet for. Won a scholarship for volunteering at this local diner that we had point towards the end of my junior year, specifically two months before it ended, I was homeless after me, and my mother were evicted from my apartment. My love of my life decided that I was dampening her mood and left me after 12 months of my time in the gutter after I talked about killing myself constantly and actually attempted to do so multiple times. I then was moved across the country, 2400 miles to be exact, 
to live with extended family while my mother got her sheet together and picked up on self-harm while doing so and lost my friends in the process. My grades went to sheet due to the fact that I have no energy to do anything but loathe around, sleep and cut myself all day however there's still hope with my SAT and ACT score, so college isn't completely out of the question, but I'm pretty sure I avoided the scholarship I received previously. I wake up every day having nightmares of everything that I once had taunting me which leaves me in a pool of sweat every time that I wake up point I never thought that I'd be this way and it's scary not knowing the person that I once was before anymore and I know this definitely isn't going to end well for me in a couple of more months if I don't change my act and get my sheet together. Just over a year ago, I experienced a very bizarre, but ultimately happy plot twist. When I was in high school, kids liked to tell me I was the kind of person to grow up to be a bit off aisle, because teenagers can be brutal. I guess I took that to heart, because I really started thinking about it, looking at, younger, kids on the beach, and asking myself am I turned on by them? Long and fairly disturbing story short, I eventually decided that I was, but that nobody could ever know. I had serious anxiety issues as a consequence, fearing people would find out, and that I'd be locked away, or whatever. When I was planning what to do for tertiary education, I struck off my ideal profession, medicine, despite academic capability, because obviously nobody wants a bedophile doctor. So I ended up chugging along in a science degree, but being eaten up by these near constant thoughts of you shouldn't exist. You don't deserve to be in society. You are broken, and if anybody knew, they'd want to behead you in the town square. Naturally, after a few years of this, I got super depressed and started hurting myself and contemplating suicide, because I felt like I deserved it I guess. It was putting a real strain on my relationship, so I finally mustered up the courage to go and talk to someone about it. I went to my GP and said I was having serious depression slash anxiety issues without mentioning that I thought I was sexually interested in kids. He referred me to a psychiatrist etc. etc. The night before the psych appointment, I was like screw this, I'm just going to tell him what's really happening. I get there and I'm like dude, I just can't stop thinking about kids in a sexual way and I hate it, he's. Like correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you have OCD, Q. Dolly zoom close up of my face as the realization dawns on me. I'm in a bi-armed science degree and I've done a couple of psych courses, so I understand a bit about OCD and what's going on neurologically, but it just all fell into place in that moment. We talked about it more and more, and the stuff I was experiencing was less symptomatic of a paraphilia and more symptomatic of a chronic obsessive fear of a paraphilia, OCD. Twelve months later, I'm certainly still working on these issues, but I'm definitely in a better place than I was last year. All is swell tldr hated myself, because I thought I was a bit off aisle, turned out to be an altogether different kind of mental illness. Always be honest and open with your healthcare providers. Moved to the city to begin my university studies. I got a job working at Maccas, Reed McDonald's for non Aussies. My very first shift was 5am to 9am which was also my very first day of uni. I decided to catch the bus from work instead of heading home first and getting changed, which I never did again. I was sitting at the bus stop, the bus was considerably late, and I was getting agitated knowing I was going to be late for my first class. This guy sitting at the other end of the bench keeps looking over at me. I was getting fairly nervous being new to the city and not having my earphones to ignore him with. He gets up and asks me what time it is. I coldly reply you have a phone. Check it yourself about another 10 minutes later the bus still hasn't arrived and he again tries to start small talk with me. I engage this time thinking what's the worst that could happen. The bus arrives, after about 5 minutes of short talk, we then both board the bus, and he sits near me, and we continue the conversation. We then arrive at the transfer point, I quickly hurry to my connecting bus, and he follows, and boards the same bus. At this point I'm kinda paranoid. Again he sits near me and we chat, he eventually asks to add me on FB to maybe get a drink, I oblige with the intention of blocking him, as soon as I got off. I then get off the bus at uni, and about an hour later he messages me. 
I reply and we chat back and forward all day. We then plan to go get a coffee. Fast forward a 6 months later we've been dating the whole time. We were having coffee and he receives a fine in the mail that his license had been suspended because of an unpaid fine. He didn't even own a car. That was the day I learned he was separated from his wife and was technically still a stepdad to three kids, one of which was older than me. Well, this is the perfect moment to tell my history. So, once I had this work, where I had to travel every month to up to 15 different towns of my state, in one of them, close to my home city, I met this beautiful stunning girl who was the sister of my contact person in that town. I had love at first sight, but I just let it go, because I was quite in opposition to long distance relationships, so I just started a good friendship with her, and we used to talk every time I went there. Once she told me she was going to move to my home city, to study in the university and there, was the capital, more chances to have better studies, so, I was so happy about it, I waited until it happened. So, she moved and I started inviting her to date, I was so happy, because she told me, that what I felt was reciprocal, and I was so into this girl, that I didn't want to rush to things, and be a gentleman, I liked so much, that I remember walking in the street, after having dinner together, that I was shaking after holding hands, and our first kiss was just perfect. Call me a fool, but I really wanted to marry her, if the relationship was successful, I just got lost into her those beautiful honey eyes we dated lots, went to grab food, movies, parks, dating for 2 months more or less, she was living at an aunt's house in my city town, since she was raised in a strict values family I always took her back to her aunt's on time, never too late, and never having a sleepover because as I said I didn't want to rush or get her into trouble. So, one day she just disappeared, ring her to her mobile, the phone was dead, I rang sister, couldn't reach her either, since in her hometown the mobile signal is just crap, I couldn't go to her aunt's, because our relationship was not known, she told me once she had strict parents and they were really concerned about it, when she decided to move and study in my city. So I didn't want to get her into trouble so I waited, then I was trying to make my workplace send me there, after a couple of months we had new cities to check, and I had workmates, you couldn't go just to the same city every month, like 2 months later I could get an appointment to the city and I also could reach the sister by phone, when I asked about her she said, don't you know the news? My sister is pregnant. When I heard that it was a blast, I didn't know what to feel. The sister told me, apparently she wasn't aware of our relationship, that she was dating one of her cousin's friend, had sex with him, while dating the stupid gentleman of me, and got pregnant, told her parents and they took her back home. Point I went to my work appointment and there she was, her belly was showing her condition. We talked, she told me crying, that the guy didn't want to get involved with the kid and left her, yep. Karma is a beach, and that she needed a father for her son, I might be a great father for him, and a great husband for her. I was upset and angry, told her and I would love to be the father of that kid and I dreamed for being her husband, but not in that way, sorry, but she was not honest with me, and she knew how I felt about her, actually for a second I thought about accepting that, I loved her so much, that I really wanted her, but I realized, that I had to love me more than love her. I just left to my work and stopped talking for many years later there are some other background histories around this one, but the main is this point edit, spelling. Spent my formative years effectively following in the footsteps of my father, while being careful to separate my own work from his name. He was slash is one of the top in his field. He was a huge inspiration to me, and I didn't want to waste the opportunities he set up for me, and lord knows I never did. Worked damned hard, and was just starting to realize my dreams. Here's the twist. Get home from studying abroad junior year of college. Finished killer internship, the whole bit. Morning after I get home, mom and dad tell me to grab a cup of coffee, we gotta talk. Fuck. Dad spills the beans. He had been using prostitutes for some time, spent a bunch of money, blah blah blah. K wine slightly out of sales, not horrible, we can recover. From there, things just got worse. 
between playing counselor to my folks, a bad idea, but was hard to see at the time, and finding out my dad just didn't give a rat's ass about us, had actually been seeing prostitutes his entire adult life. It wasn't so much that as he just refused to see it as lying to us, putting us in serious danger at times, and even almost putting us out of our home. He just didn't care. I lost it. I lost my dreams. I lost my father. K. My shrink says I never really had him anyway, and fair enough, and I lost my career. That's the short end version. In reality this took about 5 years of my life, where I completely lost my career, played with alcoholism among other things. Spent an additional 5 ish years working to put our family back together sans dad. Certainly did not think I'd be attempting to find a new career path and new life at 30, but I'm getting there. Rebuilding a life ain't easy. I was in my senior year of high school. I hadn't done very well in the past few years, but was ready to commit to getting the credits I needed to graduate. I was so ready. I was gonna rock that school year and kick it in the ass, I remember as it was yesterday. I'm hanging out with one of my best friends, playing Guitar Hero 5 which had just came out. We hear a knock at the door thinking it's our friend who we really didn't like all that much. It's my oldest brother's wife, coming to pick me up, because of a family emergency. I told my friend, that I would come back if I could. She told me I wouldn't be coming back, when his door closed, she put her hands on my shoulders, and told me something, that gave me my first experience in being shocked. Number 1 Han Solo, your brother passed away in Afghanistan this morning, I, was devastated. My two brothers were the only thing I had left that I could picture of my biological father who passed away in a head-on collision. When I was 18 months we had to go to a grief counselor after that because my mom thought it would be good for us. She mentioned to the counselor that I have trouble paying attention in class along with focusing as well. Was diagnosed with type 1 ADHD after that conversation point I met a wonderful girl that year and I fell in love with her. I thought that this was gonna be the girl I was gonna marry she ruined everything for me after 2 years of being with her I've had a lot of plot twists, but I'm 24 years old, I have a great job, that I do fantastically, I started taking meds for my ADHD, and I just married the love of my life on July 4th, 2015, in 4 days. I'm also grateful to all the service men and women who fight for our country, and who have sacrificed their lives to protect us. Thank you. I found out at 17 that I had an older sister that I didn't know anything about. My parents set me down one random night and told me this story. When my dad was mid-twenties he got his on-again off-again girlfriend pregnant. They weren't sure what to do at first. They both came from devout Catholic families. But eventually my dad decides to try and do the right thing and raise the child with the girlfriend. We'll call her Lily. The day Lily gives birth, my dad rushed to the hospital to see his daughter slash find out what's going on when he runs into Lily's mother and grandmother. Lily's family consists of her, her three sisters, her mom, and her grandma. There are no guys in the family. When my dad arrives, Lila's grandmother tells him that he isn't wanted and that he will never see his daughter again. Point my dad was crushed, but had no idea what to do. He wasn't sure if this was the mother and grandma forcing the decision on Lily or if Lily genuinely wanted him out of the picture. They never had a great relationship, so it was hard to know. He was also in his 20s and being a hippie in the late 60s was pretty into drugs and really did not have his life together at that point. He goes to his own family who console him, and they try pleading with Lily's family to let him be involved with their daughter's life, but to no avail. They sever all contact and my dad never sees his daughter I suppose my dad could have tried to get a lawyer or something and fight it out in court. But again, dad was a mid-twenties a pee. He lived on a farm in a small town in Nebraska. He slowly slipped into a pretty dark depression over the next 10 years. He moved to Chicago for a while, got even more involved with drugs. Finally he moved to Ohio where he ended up meeting my mom and had me. He had told my mom about all of this, but since he never heard from his daughter, Lily, or anyone in the family, he just assumed they didn't want anything to do with him, and so he just tried to block that history from his life. Until the day that my dad told me this story. My sister, we'll call her Sally, had grown up. Had a kid in her 20s like her mom and dad, but got married to her husband. 
had two more kids, and was now in her 30s. And yet, she still had no idea who her father was. They never even told her his name. From what I know, Sally had never really found out what had happened to him, or why he was never in her life, and it was something that always bothered the sheet out of her. Finally, she cornered her grandmother, fed up with all of the bullshit, and forced her to give up his name. Which she did point this being the internet age and my dad having a unique name led to an extremely awkward phone call at my dad's work earlier that day. Neither of them were sure of what to say to each other, or even if the other person was really related to them. She sent him a picture over email, and he sent him a picture of himself. Sally later complained to us that she never really looked like anyone in her family and it always bothered her. But looking at my sister and my dad side by side, you can tell right away that they are related. Point my dad was sobbing at the end of this story, and he was sorry that he never told me sooner. But what the hell do I care? This has obviously been a lot harder for my dad than for me. She flew out of Nebraska that weekend, and flew out a few months later with her entire family. She's a great sister, daughter, and mother. I'm glad she's finally in our lives tldr my dad had an oops baby in his 20s. The family kept him from seeing his daughter. Daughter grows up, has a family, tracks down my dad, and boom I have a sister. Parents got divorced when I was 18. It was ugly to say the least. I severed all ties with my mother fast forward 5 years. I'm getting married. Flew my dad in from Europe to be there 2 weeks before my wedding dad gets a call from my mother saying he isn't my biological dad. Went to paternity clinic and took the test 2 days before my wedding. Get a call from paternity clinic confirming we were not at all related. Saw my dad break down in front of me. Got married with no other hiccups as this was the man that raised me so he's dad. Fast forward a few months he's back in Europe and he calls and tells me enjoy life you aren't mine. Then hangs up point mom has been trying to find me for years got close once left me a message on my answering machine crying. Why I don't talk to her? I mailed her a copy of the paternity test and highlighted the results. She tries every year around my birthday to find me. I get calls from friends and old jobs saying some crazy lady was here looking for you. I have a 3 year old now. I shield him away from my crazy family, if wondering why I severed all ties with my mother it's simple. She has mental illness that is undiagnosed. Growing up was a challenge with her. Being an adult was even worse. She feeds off of drama and loves to ruin lives. My late cousin was a professor at some college back in the day 80s slash 90s. He had an addiction to heroin. She doomed him out to his school. He lost his job got divorced and lost all visitation rights to his son. He was found dead by my aunt of an odd. Mom used to brag she got him fired up until his death. Edit. Grandma. I was a failing artist for 5 years after graduating high school. Not a run appreciated in his own time. Can't find a job because art is a hard business type of failing artist. I was just bad. I had lots of ideas and great projects I wanted to work on and a lot of vision. I'd gotten into it because I viewed myself as a creative thinker, which I am and was. But I just can't and couldn't draw for sheet. No coordination or dexterity, no sense of form or color, and worst of all, terrible, writer's blockish self-scrutiny where I would erase the same line over and over for hours and end up with nothing but ruined paper. I had the idea of the perfect lines, but I was hopeless at executing them 5 years I was terribly depressed and eventually gave up and decided to go back to school for something practical. I'd do a STEM major and go to med school or something, cause at least then all the assignments will be finite, well defined, unlike art school point my first semester, I took physics and calculus, despite having no background in these subjects at all, I stopped at algebra 1 in high school and never took physics, I faking loved it, it came more naturally than anything ever had, it resonated so much with how I'd been thinking all along. The perfect lines, the dimensionality, the precise descriptions of everything point today, I'm a mathematician. I've already posted this comment in another thread, but here it is, I was recruited randomly in a Halo 4 clan a few years back, and our leader was a guy named Dorian. Clan gradually stopped doing stuff, after about a year months later, I was bored in Halo, reach and joined the custom game of a randoms Barksley friend who I hadn't talked to in ages. 
I had met him through a mutual friend, who I had only met because I complimented him on his level 130 plus Master Chief armor in a Halo 4 matchmaking session. It turns out the custom game was a clan meeting, but before they could kick me out a bunch of the clan's members started a surprise attack to try to assassinate the clan leader. I ended up helping them restore order, and I was recruited into the clan point the clan officer that recruited me, Dustin, eventually started his own clan and hired me as his third in command. He asked if there were any other clans that we could ally ourselves with and I told him about Dorian, who had recently revived the old clan. They arranged a meeting together after a few minutes, Dorian commented on how Dustin's voice sounded familiar. They figured out that they had once been in an older, unrelated clan together, in the same squad, and used to be close Sparks live friends. What's even weirder is that both of them were on different accounts from the ones they had known each other with, with completely different gamer tags. Death. Not mine, but people in my waypoint I had applied for a very hard to get, unique job, in industrial development. One of the selection officials was a past high school science teacher, Mr. J. Mr. J was a lock vote for me, since I was a good student with him, and had won the school science award, so all I had to do was split the other six, and I was in there. I could do that. The night of the interview, I got a phone call. Mr. J had died. Son of a bitch, bad luck, goddamn, etc. Rescheduled. Two weeks later, I had the interview with a new 7th guy from the state gut. I took a grilling, but make the cut 423, and got the job point. After being on the job for a few weeks, I commented about how losing Mr. J at the time of the interview was really bad luck for me, as expressed to the old secretary I inherited. Her response, uh, no, he planned to deep six you. Because of you showing him up one day in class, when you were a junior in high school he thought you were as smart as. What the fuck? The episode in chemistry class? Mr. J could be cranky sometimes, and act like an old school mom, just out of the blue. I, and two of my friends, who were the smartest people in the class, but very competitive with me, had quietly spoken to one another for just a second, when the class was near over, you going to trig? Yeah? He cut down on us all, then especially me, and wanted to know if I was so damn smart and wanted to talk so much, would I risk talking some more answering a single question for either an A or an F for the whole 6 weeks. I manned up and said, yes then one of my friends, figuring they'd be next in line to said, how about an A for all of us, if he gets it? Mr. J was doubly pissed, but replied yes then laid the question to me, name all the component element of the earth's atmosphere, and their percent portions, my memory allows me to see words and numbers, and I repeated it just like reading it out of a science book, right down to naming the two, three percent inert noble gases. He was floored. He said I earned the A's, but should learn to keep my mouth shut. When I told my father about this, he said I should go back and apologize to Mr. J which I did, yet the bastard had held this against me for 18 years, a second time much later, I felt like I was unjustly not given a project slash promotion that was latterly passed to an older manager. I put in for a week off and been gone 24 hours when I found a message on my phone late one evening. I was out in the sticks, brooding, seems the other manager was killed in a car wreck on the way to the project site to handle an emergency. They wanted me to come back, as I really is the only person with the skills to do it point now about that raise. Not as substantial as a lot of the ones on here, but mine was the night I came together with my girlfriend. I had been friendly with her for a while, never knew her too well, but we'd spoken before. One night a friend of ours was having a party. I had wanted to go, but had a headache, and figured it wouldn't be worth it. Eventually I decided against it at the last minute and went. It was going well. A lot of people showed up, and I had talked to a couple girls when I was outside having a cigarette with a couple of friends when one comes up to me saying he had good news. My girlfriend was friends with him and told him, knowing we were friends, that she wanted to hook up with me. The only problem was that I had known someone who I had long since been best friends with but was still close to was interested in her for a while. Still, I went with it and went up to her. After talking to her for a bit we walked off and did our thing. Later that night the friend found out and was furious. 
Nothing came of that really, except the already far distance between me and him increased, and I haven't really talked to him since, which I feel bad for, because we had been close a long time when we were younger. Anyway, the friend who set us up told me she wanted me to keep talking to her, which thankfully I did, because now we've been together over a year, been on a great vacation together, and have intentions to be together for a long time. I know this isn't as dramatic as other posts, but it's the night that changed my life which I'll always think about how it nearly didn't happen, because of a headache. I guess I have Exodrin to thank. Spent the last of my money for concert tickets. They announced that cameras were coming around. The camera boy was cute, made me nervous, so I ran point I had a boyfriend at the time and I wasn't available anyway, but soon after he was sent to prison, San Quentin, so that was over. I started working at a pizza place a while later. Within a few days a boy asked me on a date, and we hit it off. We took some mushrooms, and went to a concert. Plot twist 1. He told me of a girl he met there once, when he used to work there, and that she ran away for some reason, but he always remembered her. We began dating, and at the time, his mom was dying of cancer, she passed a few months into dating. After two years together, I got pregnant with a beautiful baby boy and we decided to marry. During our wedding celebrations our aunt started talking about where my mother-in-law grew up, and where my extended family lived, same town. Plot twist 2, my aunt uncle owned a children's shoe store and my uncle was a shoe cobbler and had been making my mills shoes for her all of her life as a child. Now mind you, this was more than 500 miles apart from where I had grown up, but in the same state. My mill passed away before she knew that her son would marry the great niece of her shoemaker 18 years later, and we are living happily ever after. I found out a little more than a year ago that my dad isn't my biological father and my mom knew the whole time, I'm 33. It all started because of a reddit post, of all things, that talked about blood types, which then made me really think about the logic of me being O plus and my dad being ab. To make a long story short, I confronted my mother about it, and the first thing she said was does your father know, followed by a bunch of emotionally manipulative stuff. In a way, it put a lot of how she was with me while I was growing up into perspective, emotionally distant, very concerned about other people's opinions, childish me me behavior, only interested in interacting with me when I'm entertaining to her, etc. Anyways, it even gets better. I managed to find out from her that my biological father died 4 years prior, along with all sorts of information about who he was. It was definitely eerie, in that he apparently had many of my personality traits, was smart like me, was musically inclined like me, worked in it like myself, so on and so forth. I asked her why she couldn't have told me this much earlier for a multitude of reasons, health and genetic concerns mainly, and her answer was, if I told you, you'd be mad at me. My mother basically had all this information about where I came from and withheld it from me because she just didn't want to deal with it. Point this discovery pretty much changed my life in both negative and positive ways. I've pretty much become estranged from my parents. My mom continues to act like nothing is wrong and my dad refuses to acknowledge how messed up what she did was, but I in a way feel free because I never really felt as attached to my parents as much as I felt I should have been and vice versa. I'm fortunate that I've made it a point in my life to prioritize friendships with really great people so in a way I get to make the family that I want. Also, this whole discovery really opened my eyes to some of the reasons why I'm the way I am, and I've been able to do a lot of work to move past a lot of that old psychological baggage. I still have quite a lot of rage and anger about it, but I hope that it will fade in time point in my investigation into who my B.O. father was. I've discovered that he had a kids who are my half siblings. I'm in the process of reaching out to them in order to find out more information about my B.O. father and potentially to have this whole other set of relatives. It's quite possible that they might just not respond to any messages I send, but I need to at least give it a shot and stay positive. Point TLDR found out my mom was hiding the knowledge of who my B.O. dad was from me and the dad who raised me my whole life and was incredibly shitty about it. These weren't the biggest, but the ones that I will remember for the rest of my life one. I was in an Indian boarding school in my junior and senior years. Life was pretty boring, 
since the boarding school was strict and we were allowed to go off campus once a week unless it was some important work. Me and my two friends, we went out to buy grocery and guess what we heard? A loud crowd cheering out somewhere in the distant. Naive kids with raging hormones. We thought there was some sort of concert going on nearby. The noises were on and off, so it sounded very real too. We took our grocery and started pacing towards the noise. We walked for almost a mile. Yes, we crossed the time limit and got a detention later on. And at a point we could hear that the noise is just around the corner. We had all these plans of somehow finding some entrance and getting in there and bam. Our hopes were crushed as we decided never to talk about this ever again, since we hoped that this will be the pinnacle of our stupidity. There was no crowd. In Indian weddings there is loud cheap sound system that's carried on these fella, sort of a cart, and that thing was blowing off the crowd noises as some sort of testing or something too. Another event from the same period. Our dorm was on the third floor, and it had sort of a big, the size of a terrace balcony, balcony where we used to hang our clothes to dry, and that included clothes of 6, 10th graders who lived in the rest of the building. So me and some of my friends were studying till late, and we were too tired, sleepy and high off caffeine. My bladder needed a shake, and being a lizard, I decided not to go all the way downstairs to the restroom and just get out of the door, in the big balcony and pee in one of the corners. It's summer, so it's gonna evaporate anyways right? Well so I was peeing in a corner, and was wiggling around the stream, and saw this newspaper and uuh I will like to aim the stream on this newspaper, and so I did. But wait, I peed on this newspaper and I didn't hear the sound of a thin stream of liquid dropping on a piece of paper from a height, you know, that prrr sound. But oh well, I had too much work, so I went back inside, shared the little no noise pee experience with friends and continued studying. Next morning during breakfast, it turns out that newspaper was actually a kid's towel, and we heard him complaining that his towel stinks today. Almost at once, we all jumped in and said oh that must be the cat that we saw last night. The cat peed on your towel mate. No sheet it stinks. Sorry if this was too irrelevant. I just graduated high school. I had liked this girl for a while and I never did ask her out. I always wanted to, but never did point it lead into this kind of just breakdown of how unhappy I felt throughout high school and to be completely honest, how lonely I felt. Felt like I had no friends, and I was too different from other kids to have even a good friend, let alone girlfriend. Point fast forward around 3 to 4 months and I started college. Point I had my first week of classes. First day some girl sat next to me. Thought she was cute, but I had zero confidence. Talked to this one kid in front of me and it ended. Go through the next week fine, but this girl was just stuck in my head. I thought I saw her another day that week in the same class, but I wasn't sure point I made a schedule switch for one of my classes, since it was at 8pm, what the fuck, and swapped it over to an earlier time. Next week, I have that day, where I saw that girl. I saw her, sat near her, but I had no confidence yet again and did nothing. Welp. Go to my next class, sit with my friend, and I realized she was also in it. Hey, cool. Next class, I walk out, get confused for a secretary trying to find my changed class, and lo and behold the girl I couldn't get out of my mind is standing there alone waiting for the class. Okay, that's way too coincidental, I better do something. I introduce myself, and it seems she's interested in meeting new people. She sits next to me in the next class, we work together, and then go our separate ways. I felt good, I made a new friend. Remember that class I thought I saw her in? Yep, it was her. Said hi to her again after class, that was really it. Next day I have the lecture for my changed class. Guess who is in it? That girl again. Say hi, sit next to her, get her number, and I asked her what she does for fun. I'm going on for a bit, so I'll just say this is actually very recent, and I'm planning to ask her out soon. Point I'd also like to mention that remember how I said earlier that I'd never find someone like me? Well, I did. What she does for fun is exactly what I do for fun. The way she acts is exactly how I act. Almost everything she does, even her faking birthday, is very close or even the same as me. 
It's literally like I found someone who is the exact definition of the imaginary girl I thought I'd never see. Point I took as a plot twist cause I was all down and depressed and sad about myself, and it turns out my insecurities were literally nothing, and the problems I had were just that, problems that can be fixed. I felt defeated for nothing point, and even if I don't go out with this girl, I still have the confidence of asking her out, and I also have the knowledge, now that any random person could end up being someone you really connect with. <laughs> Lived with a girl for a few of years, things got serious, almost got married. One night she went off to bed early, and I passed out on the couch point after waking up, I checked my email, and saw that her miss space was open. I knew I had a choice, read her communications or close the window never knowing for sure if something was going on behind my back. I thought we were rock solid, and I had nothing to fear I knew she had issues, who doesn't? Turns out she was into diaper fetish role playing with a couple of guys. My mind couldn't put the pieces together, I couldn't understand why they were talking about adult diapers, I thought maybe someone had a sick grandparent and they are sharing their experience buying them, and how embarrassing it was 10 years ago I didn't know diaper fetishes were a thing point I woke her up, because I wasn't about to stew in this confusion. Turns out she had been molested by her babysitter, and was lied to about it for almost her whole life, something else I didn't know. She had been wearing diapers to bed when she was back at her parents' house four years before we met. A shrink of my own later explained the link between bedwetting, diaper slash regression role playing and molestation. Of all the weird and depressing connections we had, she kept that part from me and allowed strangers share her damage. <laughs> Nothing too serious, but recently, I fell in love with a girl. I hadn't even met her, and I was head over heels crazy about her. Not long after I'd already worked out when I would first meet her, I still hadn't talked to her yet, but I knew we'd be at a party together, I asked my friend how she knew her. He said yo, she's a lesbian, I was gutted because I fell hard, but I didn't have time to process this because a bunch of my old friends from way back in primary school showed up at my house and said wanna go to glow worm cave with us? Jack brought his vape. So that night we got annihilated. It was an amazing night, but I didn't process the whole girl thing until the next day. At work. For 9 hours. Yeah. That night, another, separate friend from primary school showed up to my work not long before I had to close up shop. He asked me if I wanted to see a band with him a little later, and I said sure, I could use a drink to get my mind off of this. I had yet another legendary night where I hung out with some of my best mates from high school and went on a bit of a crawl. I had a deep and meaningful with this guy who I hadn't hung out with too much and he was resentful that we hadn't hung out more in school. I go home that night and go to bed and cause I'm a big guy, I wake up without a hangover. My friend who set me onto this girl was online on Facebook Messenger. So I said to him why did you tell me girl's name was perfect for me, she's gay. Turns out she is actually pansexual don't get me started, I know it's ridiculous and all things considered, I was in a chipper mood. I went to my cousin's place to hang and I check my Facebook feed. Turns out she is moving pretty far away for a while. So my life at the moment is a roller coaster of plot twists I wonder what'll happen next. TLDR I love a gay chick, turns out she ain't gay. Being a straight male, this makes me happy. But she's also moving away soon. So, for most of my life I had a decent dad. I mean he worked all the time having to fly out of state every week, and then got to be in state for about 4 to 8 days of the month. So I had as much of a relationship as any kid could with a person they saw that little. We bonded over old sci-fi movies. He'd give me advice about girls, he taught me how to drive, he'd just generally try to be a dad. He even helped pay for a large number of my college textbooks and cosigned on my loans for college points so you know, as good a dad as I could hope for from a guy I barely see. At 20 me disappears, and 20k of my student loans disappear. Child support completely stops on my brother. 
he's robbed me, dropped off the face of the earth, and ran away with some woman who's been arrested twice for stealing identities now. I want to put in perspective, this is a man that once paid for a used car and then drove it across country from Arkansas to California so my sister could have a car while she was working. Like, seriously until I was 20 he tried really hard to be a good dad, he had anger issues, but he wasn't a sheet human point I suppose that's the first plot twist. So my identity ends up stolen, I drop out of college, a friend's mom sets me up with an interview with a crappy little tech support job 6 years later I'm the senior night support representative, and making enough to support the family he abandoned while he hides, and his wife thing leaves snarky voicemails. Oh, and his life is ruined, because we took him to court, and he was so incredibly sheety, that his lawyer quit mid case point so. Double plot twist is that he facts himself over while trying to fact me over. I got two of them. I was very religious as a kid. I carried a Bible in my pocket, quoted from it regularly, and did my best to be the very best Christian I could be. My friends all voted me most likely to become a pastor one day point then I actually read the Bible, cover to cover. I found it to be violent, sexist, racist, vulgar, oppressive, and filled with hate, all in the name of God. Uh, this wasn't what they taught me at Sunday school. But this is the actual article that our faith was built on. I realized that church cherry picked passages from the Bible because they couldn't just read straight through. No one would believe in it if you read it like any normal book. So I dropped my faith, and, after looking into a few other religions decided to become atheist too. As a kid, I wanted nothing to do with government. I didn't want to work for any organization funded by the gut, and I wanted to keep as separated from state slash federal power as possible. When I adopted a bus cut hairstyle in junior high school, I got teased about joining the military, and I was highly offended at the very suggestion. Two weeks after graduating high school, I left for Air Force boot camp. I'm now a decade and a half into the service and I've loved every minute of it. I feel more involved with world events than I ever did as a kid and I can't believe I ever wanted a quiet life isolated from the rest of the world. Point I was a dumb, ignorant, sheltered kid. But I'd like to think that traveling the world and experiencing other cultures has broadened my perspective on life. I'm more open minded and skeptical of things than I used to be as a kid. And I hope to one day raise a family that doesn't just blindly accept information like I once did. Even though the orthopedic cerebral palsy is as plain as day and has been with me since day one, I'm probably going to be denied SSDI benefits in the near future. Why, you ask? The last job I held and the income I made there technically puts me over the threshold for eligibility. In order to qualify against my father's work history, I need to have been found disabled prior to the age of 22 point. If you're wondering why my father didn't pursue benefits for me when I was born, it's a very good question. In his infinite wisdom or egotism he did everything himself. To this day, I can't even have a phone interview or mail an important package without his interfering and wanting to help. Helicopter parents aren't cool. He's also a recovering addict, and my proximity has made it easier for him to abuse me emotionally. Point the woman at the SSA said that she'll do what she can to see that I receive the benefits that I deserve, but I truly don't know what she can do for me. All of this is still ongoing for me, so this has been very stressful for me. Point I rarely buy myself anything, but I've treated myself to Black Ops 3 and Fallout 4 so that I can make myself a little happy and distract myself from the fact that my dad's egotistical inaction so long ago will probably affect me for the rest of my life now. Started record label with one of my friends last boxing day. Bought our equipment, put ourselves in the paper etc. Trying to get some of the local indie artists recorded on better stuff than their MacBook mix and also mess around with our own stuff point initially sounds fun. Plot twist. The microphones arrive. Every single one dead on arrival. All good though. Got a refund and bought from a different company. Every single microphone dead on arrival again. Walk down to our local music store with our $180 in cash. Old blokes cleaning the place out for a move. Got four microphones and a capo with that cash point things were looking up. I had my first session arranged for the 27th of January point plot twist 11.35pm, the 26th of January, grandma dies. 
was alright though, I could spend the next day with my friend, and play music, and talk and such. I make recordings, 11 that day, call in another close friend to sing, she comes, it was really nice and something special as in my genre of blues, and at my age, musicians aren't exactly lining up, to record point get home, go to mix, still needing to take my mind off my whole grandmother situation. Plot twist, a faulty cable caused an electrical noise throughout the recordings, 8 out of 11 are ruined point was overall, not the greatest start to the year, however here I am now, my album out on iTunes, and selling like swim we're in an Antarctic winter, 60. When I was 18, I met a slightly chubby, but adorably cute 17 year old guy. His personality was infectious and his smile lit up the entire room. We started dating soon after, and his brother met my sister, they began dating as well point, after about 3 months, we, unfortunately, ended our relationship due to being dumb kids, but his brother and my sister remained together. I eventually met another man, and married him 6 months after my sister and Chubba's brother married. Fast forward 2 more years, at 22, I ended up filing for divorce, and spent a lot of time with my sister and brother-in-law for emotional support. My brother-in-law's chubby bro had moved away during all of this time, but 6 months after I had filed for divorce he moves back into town. The day he moved back, I had accompanied my bro-in-law and sister to a billiard spot, and ran into chubby brother, except he wasn't chubby anymore. He was rock solid and gorgeous. I couldn't help myself, we spent the night drinking and laughing, and he ended up kissing me, and I was instantly huked all over again 7 months pass, and my divorce was finalized, I moved in with rock solid, and we hang out with his brother and my sister like old times. Then a bomb is dropped on us when my brother in law and my sister decide to get a divorce point fast forward again to today, rock solid gorgeous guy and I are now married, expecting our first child, and my brother in law is still my brother in law. 6 years ago I was at a low point. My wife who I love dearly left me, and my PhD was going nowhere. I also had no contingency plan as academia was my only dream. I was feeling very lost, and out of love, and was seriously contemplating suicide. I used to distract myself from life by chatting up women, or supposed women, on a chat site point plot twist one. One night, when I was at my darkest point, I went online, and met a girl there. I was only in it for a fun night, but it developed into a two months long virtual romance. One thing that drew me to her was her life story. She left our home country to the US, and stayed there for a while and even got engaged to a US soldier, who was the love of her life. She returned to our home country, after he got killed in Iraq. That's when I met her. She started studying over here, but she didn't fit in, and she was feeling very lost and out of love. She had a boyfriend, but he was just a rebound, no replacement for what she had lost point I did not want to meet her in person, because of the boyfriend, so we just chatted online, but we had an amazing connection and we fell in love. I felt that I was healing her, and she was healing me. One night, she wasn't supposed to show up for our nightly chat, but I couldn't sleep, and waited for her anyway. While waiting, I thought about my research, and solved the problem. That was the breakthrough that got me my PhD. I was elated. A little while after that we met in person. It was the happiest time of my life. We had the most copious amounts of earth shattering born grade sech. I was addicted to her and she was obsessed with me. She worshipped me like a sech god. I also completed my research. I was back on the horse in more ways than one. I was love drunk point we had a full month together just for ourselves. It started and ended because she decided to immigrate back to the US. Her boyfriend who had a US passport wanted to try his luck there, and she decided to join him and start afresh there. He left a month before her. I wanted to end it on the eve of her flight, but I couldn't withstand her tears and her pain and we agreed to meet again next summer. Plot twist 2, our semi-relationship went on and off for two years and naturally became a mess and we broke contact. After a while I reflected on the pieces in her story that didn't fit well and came up with an alternative one. The only reliable piece of info I had on her was her US phone number. It took some hardcore googling, but I finally found her, and I was right. She used a different first name in the states than the local one she gave me, even though it's common there as well. It turned out 
that she indeed had a soldier fiance and he was indeed stationed in Iraq, but he never died and they have been married for years. The deceased love of her life and the unimportant boyfriend were the same person. Our chats that lasted all night, every night weren't due to her inability to sleep after her loss, there was simply a time difference. She was living in the US all that time. Our month together wasn't just a timely coincidence, she came for a scheduled visit and was looking for a vacation fling point TLDR, doesn't matter, had such, and PhD. I was around 15, soon to be 16. This woman named Lisa Rahil came into our lives about 3 years ago, saying she had lupus and cancer and would die soon. My mom took her into our house point well, Lisa wrecked everything she broke up my mom with her soulmate girlfriend and was with my mom. She turned my mom against my sister and pitted me against both of them point. So I woke up one morning in June and Lisa was packing everything up into some woman's truck with the help of another woman. I asked why and she said that it was s woman looking at the computer. I discovered later that Rahil had moved everything out of the house. I contacted my mom, woke up my siblings, and we were confused slash scared point plot twist. Turned out, Lisa was lying about cancer or any employment. She stole $17,000 from my mom, ruined her credit, paid no bills, and a week before I turned 16, the sheriff came to put an eviction notice on our house. My dad bailed us out, luckily, so I could reside in a house. Once I hit 16, I was forced to find a job. So I could contribute bills and my mom's coworker went to the food bank she volunteered at to get us food. The most embarrassing thing could happen. Another good worker baked a huge casserole so we could eat. Point Lisa came up with a cacamani story that my mom believed that she broke under pressure and was dying in a hospital. My mom sincerely believed it. Lisa had the gall to pretend to slip into morphine to undergo surgery as my aunt came to console her at our house. The calls became texts with just an alleged nurse with a first name, but no last name. Lisa's hospital said she was not a patient there, so she came up with the story she was hiding from her abusive slash molester family with an alias again. Mom bought all that for a while. Soon, the story started sounding fake. My sister moves out in disgust to my dad's, and we rely on my brother's income point mom decides to start actually investigating these claims, and discovered everything was a lie point second plot twists, Lisa was staying with my mom's two closest friends and these friends repeatedly lied to us, that Lisa was at a hospital. Turns out, Lisa did the same sheet, and pissed off one of them, so she helped my mom file a police report. Mom takes my car, confirms Lisa is staying there, and sends the cops their point now. We were not there at time of arrest, but the detective commented that she was smoking when they came and tried to run for it, attempting to jump a fence and fight. His words, she doesn't look so sick to me. Third, twist, the case was supposed to involve my mom and get our money back. Now, Lisa confessed, pled guilty, and served six months. We saw two 1000 checks and nothing since. I had to use the lawyer training me in mock trial to even get access to the case. The system screwed up. Point fourth twist. Lisa has broken probation and the FBI has a long standing search for her, since she's a fugitive who crossed state lines for grand larceny. She screwed herself when she made a fake report implicating my mother to the FBI. Point fifth twist. Wanna make 800.00 dollars and good karma? There's a bounty on her, and she's last seen around Dallas. I attempted to track her sorrias down several times but no avail. Chances are, she's hiding in the gay community. I tried starting with Celebration Church in Dallas but nothing yet. My mother was redoing the wooden siding on the house, and as she tore down the old stuff, she burned it in a pit in the backyard one afternoon, she filled up the pit with wood, and splashed some gasoline on top. To get it going then the phone rang she went to answer it, and then came back, to light the fire gasoline did what gasoline does best, and woof, mom's on fire she managed to get into my kiddie pool right away. And then my stepdad got her to the hospital. She spent 3 weeks in the burn unit, and I went to stay with my B.O. dad. Point one year later, my B.O. dad had a bonfire. To celebrate my oldest stepbrother's graduation he had a bit to drink and took a tumble over and through the fire a neighbor managed to get him to hospital. 
and dad spent about a week in the burn ward for no related reason, I was spending that week with my cousin in New Jersey so when we got the phone call that dad was in the hospital, one year almost to the day after mom had blown up, the look of absolute terror in my cousin's eyes was almost hysterical. We are not superstitious as a family, but my cousin was positive at next year, she too would face the flames point one year later. I'm on the phone with my cousin I had been trying to sort out some things from my childhood, work through feelings and family bullshit and whatnot, and I confess to her that my stepdad had been sexually abusing me, since I was 5 she tells me that she's friends with a woman whose mother dated my stepdad. Before my mom did, and her friend was molested as well I ask my cousin, didn't you think me, or my mother would want to know, that this man was a child molester? To which she gave no satisfactory response point sadly, she never blew up. Since I was young I could see my parents marriage deteriorating slowly, for over a decade I'd have to put up with them physically and mentally abusing one another I was 15 when my dad left, me and him never really got on because I wasn't excelling academically as well as my brothers, I was the one in the family getting involved with unsavory people, doing drugs etc. A few months ago I decided I wanted to see what he's doing, so I managed to track him down to Birmingham, I was under the impression he owned a restaurant. I bought a train ticket from London to Birmingham one weekend, took a taxi to Coventry Road and there I was, standing outside his establishment. It's been 6 years, so I wasn't sure what to expect, I went inside to be greeted by a huge hall, it looked like a palace. There was a desk with a young gentleman behind it, his name badge read assistant manager, so I asked him where, father's name, is, he responded by saying mister, is currently unavailable, but I'm his son, can I help on his behalf, or pass on a message, at, this point I thought about what he just said for a second or two, then when it processed I just froze, just when I was ready to see my pops and perhaps forgive him, and have him in my life again after 6 years, my feelings towards him go kaput. I ended up just leaving, getting my things, and jumping on the first return train to London. A few years ago I was working at a bar. The manager of the bar and associated leisure complex discovered I was going to uni to learn a trade that he considered very much a weirdo old man's trade and not at all cool. He mocked me frequently for this, not that it bothered me, but it was pretty obvious he was looking down on me from his perceived managerial power. Fast forward a few years I'm now full time at my trade, having left the bar. End up chatting with my old manger after bumping into each other in another bar. Manager was bragging about all the things he's done lately and then brought up that he was going to a local big music festival and had scored a cheap deal on backstage tickets for a few hundred and that all the other locals that were going would have to slim it while he is going rock star. It was at this point that I said oh you must be looking forward to that. I'll see you there he looked a little confused and said no you won't, I'll be backstage. I then had the pleasure of telling him that I would not just be backstage, but on the main stages, doing my nerdy geeky weirdo old man job with the world famous artists he was bragging about seeing, and that I was being paid good money to be there. I then inquired if he was still the big shot at the bar and he sheepishly replied he works in a KFC. Think he felt a bit stupid after that, and he's never been condescending since. Middle of October this year, got a call from a job agency saying they had found my CV on a website and would I be interested in a job they have got lined up. I wasn't interested at first as I was really settled in the job I had, but the manager of the agency rang me again and persuaded me to come in and have a chat with her about it. She was really pushy and wanted me to have this job as I was ideally suited for it. I met with her, we chatted for ages and she convinced me to go for an interview with the company she was working slash recruiting for. I had a pretty awful interview with a guy who was quite intense, so I assumed I wouldn't get the job that I was now really interested in taking. Got a call a few days later saying, can I come in to meet the guys at said workplace to see what I thought. Met them and I was pleasantly surprised that it was the type of place I would love to work in. Met the intense interview guy again, and he congratulated me on getting the job, I was never asked if I wanted it, it was like it was my job all along. I got home, wrote my notice out, and handed it into my boss the same day. He was disappointed but understood, 
I felt bad as he was a good boss and the company was pretty good. A week into my resignation period before I start my new job, I get a call from the agency lady, she had requested references from the companies I'd worked for in the past, and one of those had given the reason for me leaving as dismissal. She asked me why I had been dismissed as I had told a different story in my interview. I thought it was frowned upon if you had been sacked from a job. I naively assumed it would never catch up with me. The agency lady had to tell my new workplace people about my lie and they straight away retracted the job offer stating trust issues. All this happened in a two week period. I'm now sat waiting for my boss to get back to me to tell me if I can have my old job back or if have to join the job center queue. I had my second a little over a year ago and he went into heart failure at 8 days old and was diagnosed with a heart problem called ortic stenosis and was unsure if he would pull through the night and had to have a surgical procedure and ended up being in the coup for 2 weeks. 2 weeks later I had a gut feeling something was wrong I brought him into hospital and he was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension and cardiomyopathy and a few other heart issues and was told my son was terminal and they thought he wouldn't make it through the week and they wanted me to take him home and watch him die. I refused and wanted to give my son the best opportunity to have life and wanted my son to know I believed in him at most so he had a DNR but I wouldn't leave with him till I felt my son had stabilized. Slowly my son's pressure on his lungs reduced from his pulmonary hypertension, which is unheard of, and it got to a point where they could no longer see it on scans, and he was no longer classed as terminal, and it had never been seen before in the world. He was finally cleared to have his first open heart surgery, because one of his other conditions was increasingly helping my son decline so me and him flew to Melbourne do he could have his surgery. My eldest stayed with his father, and on the day my son had surgery their father did drugs drove my two year old around, while under the influence, and went out night clubbing I didn't find out till I got back two weeks later, and that he had done it numerous times. He was an abusive husband and I kicked him out giving him opportunity he moved out faked heaps of chicks, and belittled my children in the process, so now I'm a single mother, and he is no longer allowed to see them, because he is still high and narcissist. But this has been the maker of me, I've learned what me and my children deserve, and I'm in university, so I can be a pediatric cardiologist, pediatric cardiac surgeon and researcher. My then wife was very addicted to drugs and alcohol. After years of begging her to get help and her refusing, she then got pregnant by the guy she was cheating on me with and then went and had an abortion behind my back point I finally approached her for a divorce. Me being a cop, never even drink alcohol or obviously use drugs, and me having raised my daughter, different mother, all my life as a single father we decided on 50 over 50 custody, since my son wanted to live with me and my daughter, but I didn't want to hurt the wife any more than she was already hurting from her addictions. She decided that getting a paycheck, child support, was more important after nearly two years of 50 over 50 custody by mutual agreement. We all laughed as she filed papers to take my son from me. A drug addict versus a stand-up citizen who already raised one kid alone, who had straight A's and was off to college now. There was no way any judge in their right mind would take a child from a stable 50 over 50 custody and hand him over to a drug addict. She admitted in court she was an addict. Plot twist. She had found a lawyer that was good friends with the judge, even worked for the judge for nearly a decade. Judge listened to two days of testimony from professional witnesses, personal witnesses, family witnesses, even a state assigned child representative. All saying I was of a model parent, and she was a drug addict, and even had abused our kids to a point. The ex-wife had zero witnesses or testimony, not even her own mother showed up. She won. Son was taken from me, screaming and crying. He now lives with her and her. 14 years in prison for armed robbery and drug dista, felon she was cheating on me with. I was skateboarding at my friend's house, about to ollie over a grind box for the first time. I tried it about 3 times, each time either hitting the front of the box, or jumping up it, and landing on my eyes on the street. I finally stuck my feet on the board the fourth time point then, without any warning, the board shot out from beneath me, the road was slanted downwards, and I landed flat on my back on the street. My left arm 
however, slammed down on the sharp metal coping on the box, essentially snapping both bones like a twig. I looked over, and my arm looked like a staircase, it was so bent, and the bone was sticking out, with blood squirting from the whole point this was a week before my birthday freshman year of high school, on labor day. I ended up staying over 4 days in the hospital, undergoing 2 surgeries, and having 2 metal plates implanted in my left arm, one on each bone, screws and all. I managed to make it through the rest of the semester one handed, doped up on Valium and painkillers almost 24 hours a day. I missed over 2 weeks of school, and ended up having to play catch up the entire semester, making up tests from the first month less than 2 weeks before winter break point I still have two 2 inch scars on my arm, and a smaller one on top from surgeries. It's been 2 years since then, and I still have restricted movement. Long story short, don't our Leon slanted curves, if you suck at skateboarding. My parents divorced, when I was 5 years old. My dad was a marriage counselor at the time, which I found ironic as I got older. As kids we were always told that our parents had argued about money a lot, and that was the reason for the divorce. Being a kid you just accept what you are told a lot of the time point anyway, skip ahead 10 to 12 years, and on an especially boring day I'm going through a bookshelf at my mom's house. There's a Karim Abdul Jabba book sitting there that I'd seen one thousands of times, but for some reason it seems really odd. Dad was a huge Lacquers fan from when he was in grads grad school in San Diego, but mom couldn't care less about sports ball point I pull it down and open the cover. On the inside is a note, Davis 25's dad, thank you for all your help. It was wonderful point Travis 25 stepmom, date from before divorce, I was floored. I didn't know what the fact to think. I went to my older sister to see if she knew. She's 15 months older than me, but the way she would talk and act she was trying to be 5 years older. Anyway, she'd known for a few years. Dad had counseled my stepmom through her divorce point I felt lost. How had I not known? Did dad actually cheat on mom? Did everyone know? How much of my currently shitty life was a lie? Anyway, I confronted my dad. Asked him what really happened. He gave a bullshit answer along the lines of I realized I had never loved your mom, and it wasn't right to her to stay with her, yeah. Dad, that's why you left your wife of 10 years, 3 kids, and successful counseling, practice to be with the emotionally compromised 20-something blonde who was starting med school. Pull the other one point I ended up talking to a lot of people, including one of the other partners at dad's old practice, and came to the conclusion. That he left before something physical happened, but it didn't change the outcome. He got too close to my stepmom when he was counseling her, and it didn't matter if he faked her with his dick or his mind. It was the same end result point after that I didn't let myself be friendly beyond a very basic informal level with women I wasn't in a relationship with. Is it healthy? Probably not, but I'll be damned if I hurt my wife and kids the same way he did. Throughout my childhood I was called lazy and told I had to get my priorities straight. I struggled throughout middle school and high school. Constantly forgetting to do homework. Sleeping in class. I couldn't help it and nobody believed me. Point The only reason I passed high school is because my counselor subbed a news writing class for an English credit point after high school my life continued to deteriorate. Point For a time, I was working 30 plus hours in retail. Eventually I moved down to working a part-time office position because it was all I could handle. I was sleeping almost 12 hours per day and plagued with insane headaches I went to my doctor and complained how I was constantly tired and he told me I was probably diabetic and had me tested. Shortly after I was put on medication but it didn't help point I was still plagued by my issues which included lots of pain in my head and back, bad nights of sleeping 12 plus hours at a time forgetfulness, etc. One night I was up late, half falling asleep on my couch and I decided to watch a documentary, or something, can't remember specifics, on Reggie White. I'm from Wisconsin and a huge Packer fan, so it piqued my interest point at the end they talked about his death from something called sleep apnea and briefly talked about it. I looked online about sleep apnea and everything fit my symptoms perfectly point I scheduled an appointment with my doctor and he had me take home an oximeter to test my blood slash oxygen level point the results were so terrible that he didn't even bother with a sleep study. 
he wrote me in recipe for a variable pressure machine. To speed up the process of me getting a CPAP machine point it completely changed my life point since then. I've gone to college, graduated, and become a software developer. And I'm in the process of rebuilding my life. Looking at my medical history, it's clear that I've suffered from sleep apnea since I was a small point. If it wasn't for a deceased member of my favorite football team, I would probably be dead today. Thank you, Reggie White. I'm late point probably my mother one of the best, brightest, and strongest people that I've ever loved. Until I was about 12 to 13, things weren't perfect, but were at least harmonious times were hard for us, and we had to move a few times. We went through debt and financial issues. She didn't have any qualifications, but she took up any job that she could in order to make things float. She eventually landed a job as a cleaner her coworkers were vicious and were frequently hard on her because she wasn't English but could speak better English than she could, self-taught. She often came home looking wrecked and miserable but still pulled a smile. At 13, I grew up fast, took my studies seriously and did what I could to make things easier for her. She just told me to study and that's it. She didn't need me to do more point then she had a car accident. Initially we thought it was whiplash, but it developed into fibromyalgia. I suggested acupuncture to relieve the growing tension in her muscles, but it didn't work. It was a lot of wasted money for nothing. I hate myself for suggesting it. I just wanted her better. I feel like I just made things worse point she went to the doctor, and he told her it was all in her head and to get back to work. She did, but the pain didn't go. Eventually she fell into depression. My dad is a stoic guy, so he rarely got involved in things like this. As far as he was concerned, I guess the doctor was right and mum's decisions were her own. If they ever talked about it together, I guess I never caught wind of it. All I noticed were my parents' darkening mood swings, their growing doubts and the increasing expectations for my grades. In the meantime, I was getting bullied by kids at school, but I tried to be single-minded and focused, even when I got hurt. It's like I was disconnecting myself from the world, because there was an end goal, it was going to make things better of course, that in itself was a lie. The saving grace was that my mother received some compensation from the accident, but nobody thinks of what's left in the mind point my beautiful mother is a shell, and despite all efforts, she's suffering, unable to sleep, and she's punishing herself every day. She won't look for help, and won't ever talk about her feelings with anyone. She avoids her friends. She doesn't really look after herself. Instead, I see it every day. I get to see her tolerate every waking moment point she tries to hide her injuries if she falls. Her balance is poor from the meds and her mobility. I know that she feels useless, but I wish that she'd ask for help. It's severed all opportunity to talk about our feelings. Instead, we are all clamming up point we are a unit rather than three human beings. Due to my own personal events, I do have depression, anxiety, and trust issues, but I remember having a lot of confidence prior to mum's accident. I looked up to my parents, right up until we couldn't talk to each other. From there, I was left with uncertainties things are getting better for my parents, but events have certainly taken their toll. The debts are gone, mum's on disabled benefits. We still can't communicate with each other. I live each day with wondering if there was something else I could have done. Something more point too late. I'm 27 and for the first 21 years of my life, I had a friend with whom I was inseparable. Both our mothers were nurses who worked at the same hospital who were best friends. We actually had the same due date, though I decided to be born 3 weeks early. Anyway we hung out all the time until one day, around our 21st. He tells me he's getting married to his girlfriend. Normally this is something to be excited about, but the woman he was dating, and still presumably married to, was not a good person. At all. There are few people I truly abhor, and she is one of them. I express my concerns the best way I know how, and he 100% understood where I came from, but that's when he told me she was pregnant. I asked if that was the reason why they were getting married to which he replied no, of course not. Yet, having known this person for two decades, it was easy to read between the lines. He wasn't happy, but wasn't about to walk out on his future child. They got married, shotgun style, 
and I didn't get to see him again until his son was born. Different citizen jobs. A few months roll by after that, and I try to hit him up on Facebook. No profile. No worries, I'll call him. Cell disconnected. He didn't live too far from his parents and I called their house. When I asked where he was, his mother was just silent on the other end, and I heard shuffling on the other side. His brother picks up and say, you don't know where he is? He and wife just up and left with son there. Are some bits in between that I won't go into, but long story short is, she convinced him that his family was poisonous and she didn't want them or me to negatively impact their child's development. Every now and again, we got whispers that he may have joined the military branch, but nothing substantial point that was six years ago. Been trying to find him ever since. About a year ago I just stopped. I really didn't know how to continue or where to continue. Well, about two months or so, just before Facebook got rid of that other message tab, I see a little one next to it. It was from some random photography company's page, his wife considered herself to be a photographer. I clicked on it, and the message read, hey man, it's, friend's name. This is, wife, s business page, but I really need to talk to you, and that was it. I clicked on the link to the business page, and it said it was no longer active. I couldn't respond to the, the message directly, because it was linked to the business page. Five years I looked for him and nothing. I finally give up, and he gets through to me, only to have the one means of communication be disabled. Just, dangled and pulled away at the last second point positive side, at least he's still alive. Negative, his wife still has her manipulative claws, stuck in him in some capacity. The most frustrating feeling in the world is to have an ailing friend slash family member, and you can't do shit to help. It's mandatory that I preface this story with the fact that I'm atheist point living in the Bible Belt. It's rare for me to have a friend or acquaintance that is not a Southern Baptist. That said, my friend, a Southern Baptist, invited me to this Wednesday festival they had. I, being the nerdy kid whose parents begged him to leave the house, decided to oblige point we went, I got free pizza, although it tasted like sheet. And I had a relatively good time. At the end of the session the youth pastor sat us all down on the floor and told some funny stories that turned around to give some Christian moral at the end. Then, he told us all to close our eyes as the light stimmed point my eyes are closed and I'm expecting some funny joke, but no, he says something along the lines of if you love Jesus stand up. I was under the impression that everyone would be standing up. It was a church event, right? Nope. One I was standing I heard clapping and opened my eyes to witness only four others and myself standing. Apparently I had just been saved by Jesus Christ. I kinda gave an awkward smile and followed instructions, giving them my Facebook and stuff. I eventually had to ditch that Facebook account because they kept messaging me wondering why I never showed up afterwards and I was too awkward to explain point TLDR. Atheist is now on good terms with Jesus. I had been married 14 years, had one child with another one on the way, to cars, rented a house, we were just barely making it financially, but we were a happy family. I had just started maternity leave when I got a call from my husband, a window washer on an out of town job, that he had fallen 30 feet onto tile and his co-worker was driving him to the hospital. Yeah, they didn't even call an ambulance, I can't even remember the next few hours. I just started driving toward the hospital he was headed to. Our life was about to change forever. His heel was completely crushed, and four vertebrae also crushed. The doctor said the ride in the car after such an injury could easily have done irreparable damage but apparently, my husband has dumb luck and he could still feel a finger up his ass. He spent six months, either laying or standing, in a back brace, and was unable to sit the whole time point now to the good part. He made an almost complete recovery. He just has a shorter leg and wider foot on one side and some back discomfort. Our daughter was born, and he was able to spend the first six months of her life at home with her. He used the time to learn coding, something he never would have done otherwise. The next year he got a job burning three times. What he did as a window washer. Fast forward 18 years to the present. We own our house in a lovely neighborhood. He works from home, and is very successful lol, because a hornet's nest was in just the right place. 
I have a lot of plot twist stories. Girl I was in love with for years, who wouldn't give me the time of day, ended up my wife. After we got drunk in Vegas had a house. Strong business and a wife in March. By the end of April, lost house. Biz shut and wife left. All related to money, met up with a girl I had a huge crush on in high school, who had been married with kids for years, randomly while catching up with a different high school friend. In the weeks that follow old flame wants to reconnect and eventually confesses being in love with me and wanting to leave her husband. Didn't go down. In fact, I started seeing another girl go to meet this girl I was crazy about one day and walked into her shop and there she is with the girl I liked in high school who had contacted her to tell her that I'm a smarmy bastard. They confront me. Of course there was nothing I could say since they were prepared for my excuses. So I laughed and said, it's hard not to play when there are so many toys. They were pissed and I was really upset about it. Old Flame went back to her husband and he and her somehow made it all my fault, but the other girl ended up becoming my girlfriend after a few months, but it turns out she was keeping her husband and kids from me, ugh. So I told her to work that sheet out, before looking for a new guy and split. About a year later, she left him, and a year after, that she and I got together again. How you meet um is how you leave um. She found another guy, rich guy, and a year after we moved in together we split up because she was cheating. Lesson learned. I was really messed up about this. I didn't find out about the other guy for about 6 months after we split. Did all the things. Deleted Facebook. Rode a motorcycle cross country. Hit the gym. And when I was done I met my ex's new guy's ex-wife who apparently he was very much in love with and was playing my ex to make her jealous. So in the classic small town love square I started dating her and the dude was pissed. My ex was pissed too because she thought it was about her. It was great. But it all imploded eventually and everyone split up point tldr. Yeah, that pretty much sums up 2006 to 2013 of my love life. It's like a minefield. I married my high school sweetheart and we were married for 24 years. My life has been full of them point plot twist hash 1. Finding out I was pregnant during an early visit after a car accident. Totally unplanned and on birth. Control at time of conception. This caused me to drop out of college. Plot twist hash 2. Diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis 5 years later in the days before biologics such as Enbrel. Took 4 years of a varying cocktail of drugs to get it under control including prednisone, which caused major weight gain. Plot twist hash 3, in 2006, I was planning gastric bypass surgery due to all the weight gain. During the pre-surgery testing and counseling I had been told that about half of all marriages fail after this surgery due to lifestyle changes and other things. I went home in a panic and husband promised that would never be us 4 years after surgery and after plastic surgery removing excess skin, I had a bad recovery. Husband was on a layoff from his job and taking on odd jobs to help pay bills. He spent more and more time with the daughter of one of our friends, to the point that I knew he was cheating on me, which he adamantly denied. I found proof and offered ultimatum. Stop seeing her or get out. He chose her and left. After things were final, they married three and one half years ago. Plot twist hash four, they are now getting divorced, and she's being nasty. Lied to court to have restraining order put into place, so she could kick him out and move her new boyfriend in. Plot twist hash five, he's now living in the basement of my home, with my new husband's encouragement, as it's the right thing to do. He's severely depressed, broken physically and mentally, has no money or job. It's hard to turn your back on someone you've known for 30 years. Is it also karma? Most definitively, but you do what you have to do in life. At age 25, I elected to have a prophylactic double mastectomy due to genetic likelihood of breast cancer, and having watched my aunt and mother go through the cancer and surgeries, I knew a surgery like that would be much more intense if cancer treatment was in the mix. I had the surgery in late July of 2014. For a couple months after, I struggled with intense vomiting and nausea, later diagnosed as gastroparesis. Within weeks of a 5 day hospitalization, couldn't keep down water, my dad was diagnosed with an early catch of prostate cancer. 
I had my final follow up surgery within a couple weeks of his biopsy point that December, my mom started having back pain. She thought she must have pulled something. The pain continued for weeks, months. Finally she went to a doctor who said it was likely a herniated disc. She went to work, and that evening went to an MRI. She was then transported to a different hospital, rather bewildered, and told that she had a large tumor that required emergency spinal surgery. Point it turns out within weeks of turning 51, in April 2015, she was diagnosed with stage 4 breast cancer, metastasized to nearly all her bones, despite having been declared cancer free after fighting stage 1 10 years. Prior and then an elective mastectomy 5 years prior upon finding out she had the genetic mutation point I'm 26 now. All these things have been major plot twists. Relearning how and what to eat. Relearning my body, my needs, my looks. Squaring my choices with closed doors in the future, like breastfeeding. How to spend time with my parents. Terrified of dating. Terrified of not dating. Wanting to carve out a normal. Worried and fragile, but pushing forward. Met a couple of girls during a Vegas guys trip. My friend fell head over heels for one of them. Both were hot, but her friend was a total beach. Had to wing man, and listen to her complain, and beach about everyone and everything all night. Finally lose my patience with her, and her shitty attitude. Finally told her off. Luckily my friend ended up getting enough time with her girlfriend, to make a good impression. Vegas trip ends, we go back to Oregon, they go back to LA. But my friend and his girl are still talking. Then he starts flying down, once every couple of months, then once a month, then every couple of weeks. He finally convinced her to move to Oregon, and within a year they are engaged. Now this is my boy, so of course I'm in the wedding. Guess who I get to walk with? That's right mega beach point wedding day arrives, and I'm determined not to ruin it for them. Vow to go into the experience with a good attitude. She must have thought the same thing, because she flew up, and had a completely different attitude. She was kind, and polite to everyone, even charming. The magic of bridesmaids and alcohol cannot be denied, and of course we end up huking up. She stays to watch their house, while they're on their honeymoon, and we set about turning what should have been a one night stand into a two year relationship. I'm way late to the party, but reading about 1300 comments here made me think I want to share my story too, a positive one, for once, let's go back to 2008, I'm in year 10th, and 100% sure I want to study architecture, I take a drawing course, confirm I have next to no art skills, but meet a fantastic girl with huge talent and a desire, to be the person, to make patterns for textiles, wallpapers and the like, does the job even have a name? We become friends, hang out all the time, after a month, she asks me out. I decide, what the heck, why not? We end up together, it's my first relationship, all love aid over etc, but her group of friends, whom I never got along with, end up convincing her to break up with me point I have a couple short term relationships after that, and finally realize, that dating girls whilst also being one isn't defined as straight. I shrug, decide to simply not inform my super catholic family, to the point where my grandma, concerned with all the female friends I had, would regularly lecture me on not letting them turn me gay. Q late 2009 slash early 2010, she and I run into each other at a university tour. Neither of us knows anyone there, so we end up working together on pair activities, and later grab a coffee. We get back together afterwards, and she commits to keeping her friends opinions out of her own point we are together through finals, graduation, applying to university, and getting in. Since we both live in the same town where we study, both of us live with our families, it's out of the question for her to visit mine, but her mom adores me, so I frequently stop by. Everything seems great, we are even planning to go on an international exchange program together, our respective faculties off to the same destination, and live together for real, maybe even find a place like the states, where we can properly start a family someday after uni. Point Q Halloween of 2011. She goes to a party with her friends, I hang out with mine, the next morning I find out from a friend of hers she's not with us anymore. 
overdosed on antidepressants. The stupid sheets thought she was just passed out drunk when in fact she was dying slash dead. So they only called emergency after someone noticed she's not breathing point not able to tell anyone I know about the situation. I never properly grieve her. Instead I have some horrible self-destructive relationships and lose faith in things getting better. Fast forward to March 2013, when I start talking to a guy online, we become great friends, then a couple, half a year later I moved to Malta to live with him. I'm now happily in love, we are living together back in my hometown, both with stable jobs, a love for travel and video games, and a cat. He knows my story, and accepts there's a person I'll never fully let go of, and supports me in getting through all the grief that I kept internalized point in spite of everything. I'd say my life's at a strong 9 tenths point TLDR, ideal but hidden from all relationship, so dies, don't get to grieve openly, self-destruct, meet current so, working through issues, life's good. Not a plot twist that happened to me, but a plot twist that happened around me point there's a girl I'm friends with who's a school year younger than me, but we were born either side of the dividing line for when you start school, so the age difference is only 3 months. I'm a college freshman and she's a high school senior everyone wanted us to go out. Everyone. I only have like 6 or 7 people who I'd call myself clothes with, but there were 18 people trying to get me to date this girl. She was in the top 10 of her class. Parents were doctors, at one point she told me she wanted to go to John Hopkins for her MD point her parents respected me from afar. As in, they think I'm a good enough person as guys go, planning to be an engineer, but at the same time I'm a guy and I am, slightly, older than her, and her father's default is to distrust all males with regards to his daughter problem, was we didn't want to date each other. We were just friends. She always looked like she was flirting with me to other people, but that's how she acts with everyone, and she doesn't realize it looks like flirting. She was perhaps the most oblivious person I've ever met, including my middle school self point plot twist, Metherficus, over the summer she started hitting the gym, hard. A 30 year old MMA instructor and bodybuilder who went to the same gym started intersecting their workout schedules more and more. He decided he was going to train her and by train, what I actually mean is fact, there. Dating now. She no longer plans to go to a top 40 med school because she would rather run away to Florida with him. My poor aunt. She is second in a line of four girls then one boy. Her older sister became a grandma and her youngest sister, my mom, became a grandma. Now it looks like she may not even have the chance to become a grandma because child hash one passed away earlier this year. She was terminal and it was expected but it still sucks that everything that happened to her finally caught up with her about 25 years later. Medically there's no way she could even have children so she's been out of that running since childhood. Child hash 2 is not yet married and just a few weeks ago at age 30 ended up having cervical cancer and had to say adios to her reproductive organs. She'll probably adopt but that's likely a ways down the road point child hash 3 is getting a divorce. It was absolutely out of nowhere and very devastating to our family, especially as they were the sweetest happiest couple. I was looking forward to being pregnant at the same time as her. Who knows if and when my cousin will find the girl of his dreams and have kids. My aunt is almost 60 and will be a much older grandparent, especially since her parents, my grandparents, became grandparents at 40. I can tell she's really upset about it, but there's a silver lining in that my oldest aunt died of cancer several years ago now, and therefore this aunt and the other aunt have stepped up to be the best great aunts those kids could ask for. The worst decision I've made in my life so far lead to my current happiness. This will be long point I've always been terrible at dealing with stress. My dad died of cancer when I was 12 and that kicked off my depression. When I was 20, my mental health has been in rapid decline for a while. I had dropped out of two colleges and a private ed school and recently broken up painfully with my boyfriend of 3 years. I then start having unexplainable pains that later turned out to be literally crippling fibromyalgia, and I finally had to completely give up on all my ambitious dreams. It was a turbulent time for me, I was in the middle of planning to move to England, to start a new life with a guy, who later turned out, to be an emotionally abusive absolute dick. 
All our plans turned out to be his manic pippa dreams, caused by the bipolar disorder he didn't tell me about before I moved. He plays on my insecurities and subtly turns every fight around to somehow be my fault, and I believed it. He then gets more and more jealous and controlling, becomes addicted to sleeping pills, and excuses all his fuck ups on the memory loss they cause. In the end he was extremely paranoid, thought everyone was out to get him, myself included, refused to recognize there was anything wrong with his thoughts, and he never got any psychiatric help despite that being his promise every time he faked up and apologized and begged me to stay. I only stayed the last few months because I had a neurologist appointment that I had been waiting for for half a year. He ended up throwing me and all my stuff on out on the street in the middle of the night in January because I hadn't paid enough attention to him that day point however, while it was horrible and I couldn't be around him, I stayed at a friend's place for a week and I ended up falling in love with her and her with me. I wouldn't have known her if I hadn't moved to England. I inevitably had to leave and go back to my home country, but she spent all her money on a passport so she could come visit me too. She was loving caring and committed from the beginning, and even though we both have our problems, we can take care of each other. She moved to Denmark with me four months later. I've never been happier in a relationship. She's currently studying Danish, I'm steadily making progress with the treatment of my illness, and I'm hoping to start college part time soon. Back in 1994, I started work with a large national corporation near Chicago. About a year after I started, a girl started working there in the cubicle next to me, and we started dating, despite my misgivings about a working relationship point every year. Our department had a Thanksgiving dinner and another dinner right before Memorial Day weekend. I coerced and begged her to go to the Thanksgiving dinner with me, and she eventually went, but was pissed at me almost the whole time. Everything seemed fine for the next few months, but sometime in February slash March, she became more and more verbally abusive. Anytime I was over to her house, she was snapping and yelling at me, her mother, father, anyone except the family dog point she finally refused to see me, and at work, refused to talk to me. She arranged early lunches with my friends without inviting me, so that I went to lunch by myself. Eventually, she started inviting me, but by then, I was in a downward emotional spiral. One day, she brought in a treat she used to make for me. It was my favorite, and I told her that many times. She handed out every piece, and then dropped the empty pan off at my desk. I literally felt something in my head snap when she smirked at me and walked off. I got up from my desk, walked out to my car, and drove home without saying a word or changing my expression. I could feel myself breaking point the cops arrived at my door to check on me, but after about 15 minutes, I convinced them that I wasn't a suicide risk. Honestly, I think they relaxed as soon as they saw me. I'd been crying, and I probably looked helpless anyway. It took months of therapy to get better, especially because she went to the Memorial Day dinner with a guy she met at the Thanksgiving dinner. They announced that they were engaged and had been dating for 5 months ironically, it was that engagement announcement that eventually got her fired. Everyone that worked in the office with me knew by then what had happened. I did my best to ignore her announcement but found out later that she was apparently looking right at me when she told of their engagement. Our boss saw that and finally had enough of her manipulations and behavior towards me around the office. She was written up a few times and fired about a year later she is still with the guy she met at Thanksgiving dinner and they have kids. The people in the office rallied around me and ostracized her which helped me put it all behind me. Even still, I took a job transfer to California a few months later to get away from her in California. I met my wife and we had our son who is the single best thing that ever happened to me all because I forced a girl to go to a thanksgiving dinner edited for clarity and grandma. My entire life, I had been looking forward to going to university, I've always been a huge nerd, and tertiary education hadn't just been a plan, but a goal, it was something that little country bumpkin raised, nerd by nature me had always dreamed of point my first year of university, and, as a result of quite a few shitty things happening all at once, classmate committing suicide in my final year of high school. 
my granddad dying of cancer, my uncle stealing the family farm and selling it, and then kicking my nana out of the house. She and my granddad had lived in for more than 60 years, your normal nerd stress about getting perfect grades in school, and a series of earthquakes that faked up my city beyond all recognition. Looking back, it's not a shock that I ended up how I did. Clinical depression hit, and hard. I ended up failing half of my first year at uni. I spent most of my time unable to leave my bed, starving myself and ignoring the world around me. My grades, which had always been well above average, got so bad I was having panic attacks at the mere thought of doing any work, it was just too much. It didn't help that I refused to admit to myself that anything was wrong, even though I'd had the example of my mum and her depression in front of me all my life, I was my own worst enemy and convinced myself I was just feeling under the weather like I said, looking back, I'm not shocked I ended up depressed. But at the time, it absolutely blindsided me. Maybe not the biggest, but the most recent, ever felt like the chosen one? Like this is your moment? When I had a hunch, an urge, a gut feeling, that the time might be right I texted my friends and they ummed and ahed, do you really think it could be? I convinced them, cajoled them into sharing this vision, that it was indeed the golden hour. The adventure was set. Admittedly there was little to lose, this adventure would be a memorable and grand experience, a great time with great people. But would it be the ultimate adventure? Would everything fall into place? We had to get there first, on a Friday night the world turned in the right direction. The army which we were to follow on this adventure had a great and unexpected victory. Things were falling into place. Another glorious win, this time experienced in person followed two weeks later. Around this time I had put my name in a select ballot to be a real part of the Coliseum on the day of the final battle. My friends and I waited with bated breath. We had achieved the victory, the stage had been set, but our seat at the table had not been confirmed. Everything else had been booked and paid for. Transport, accommodation, events. But that ticket to the showdown still hung in the air. Richer men than us had their spots confirmed, but as humble men this ballot was a last hope point then late on a Sunday afternoon we were selected point celebrations were on the horizon as we marched across the country to the hallowed ground. We were indeed blessed and the light was shining on us. Surely after two months of planning, our destiny would be one of glory. We marched with our horde, shouting our name, and waving our banners we sat in the heat of the hottest day for this contest in many years. We sat quietly confident, donned in our colors. We held our breath as the sphere flew into the air to begin the contest point then they flogged us by 46 points faking Hawthorne. My first legit girlfriend and I were extremely close. We started dating when we were 16 while living in a code dorm. It was like a boarding school, so we had curfew and wartnet, so we just spent all our time together. Literally between 8 and 16 hours every day. She came from a religious family, so she wanted to wait until she was married to have sex. It wasn't a huge deal to me, especially since we still fooled around pretty regularly, and I'm a relatively easy person to please. Even chose my college, based on the idea that we would end up married. Went through a lot of shit together. After about 2.5 years of dating, I found out that she had lost her virginity to get Kawalker a couple months back and continued to cheat on me with him. I was really devastated for a long time, but now I'm extremely glad she showed her true colors. They ended up engaged 6 months later. I think the fact that she had lost her virginity to him was a pretty motivating factor, but I could be wrong. This was about 3 years ago that I found out and we broke up. Haven't talked to her or even looked her up since, but I hope she's happy. I haven't dated seriously since then, but I've had some fun no doubt, and, having gotten used to spending ridiculous amounts of time with her, I was able to develop a really good friend base with all my newfound free time. Sometimes I still feel like sitting down with her and asking her what the fuck her problem was, but I'm also not opposed to never talking to her again. Met the girl of my dreams when I was 3. Had no idea at the time, of course. Spent much of my young life teasing her and being teased by her. Spent years ignoring her as I was a young kid embarrassed by liking a girl, as expected. Finally come to the realization I have major feelings for this girl in high school. 
hang out with her constantly, but she's dating other guys. College hits but we are states away from each other. She visits me, and I foolishly introduce her to the girl I'm interested in, yet sleep with her that night. I visit her the next year, and she introduces me to the guy she's interested in, yet we sleep together those two nights. Speak daily from then on. Start dating when we both move back home after college. She gets her dream job a few states away, and we go long distance. We talk happily about me finding a job close to her to make this work. About how we both dream of marriage and kids. I get a job near her. I move to the same town 6 months after she does. Things are going great for 3 months. I have a ring, and I'm ready to propose to the woman she's become that I love. Then she hits me with it. She met someone else shortly after she moved. All those conversations of marriage and kids were not with me in mind. Two days after she tells me I find out my company overhired and I'm let go, living in a city I can't afford, in which I know few people but her. She didn't want to tell me because she didn't want to hurt me. She failed miserably. Have had major distrust of getting close to anyone since. Figured the girl I'd known since I was three would know me well enough to know that all I care about is honesty. She married the other dude, or maybe I was the other dude at this point, a year or so later. I'm so happy that she is happy, but she hasn't woken to me since. Wasn't even invited to the wedding, I wouldn't have gone, but I'm still bitter about knowing someone for so long, and sharing so much our lives together, and being written off so quickly point at it, various typers, never type on a phone while drunk, and reminiscing sad moments, it takes forever to correct. This one isn't as fancy or good as a lot of other people's but here goes. I've always suffered from self-inflicted guilt and social anxiety, and relationships were very difficult for me as a result. I spent my young adult life, 18 to 25, single and unwilling to even consider dating someone, because I was convinced I didn't deserve it. Point one day I meet a girl online, we click better than anyone I've ever met. It doesn't take long for us to admit attraction to each other, and suddenly I found myself in a long distance relationship. She was great at understanding my insecurities, and letting me feel like she cared about me, and told me often how happy I made her as well, but it was a complicated situation. Due to strange and unlucky circumstances we weren't able to meet in person for quite a while. We waited over a year, until we got the chance to finally meet. Talking every day, and even though I was frustrated we couldn't meet, I was slowly building my self-confidence back up. A few weeks before we were about to meet in person, 14 months into the relationship, she unexpectedly ends it with me, telling me she found someone else, and she couldn't deal with the possibility of me moving further away in the future. There was not even the faintest of warnings for it, and I found myself immediately losing every bit of pride in myself I was building up, blaming myself for it, and going through an extremely difficult bout with depression. And before you jump to conclusions, I know she genuinely cared for me even then, and I know she was not faking her identity, since both of us were already very uncomfortable with the idea of lying to each other to begin with, that's the twist. But here's the epilogue, I'm moving across the country in a high risk situation, in order to try and get my life moving forward again. And even though I'm 26 and still pretty awful at relationships, I finally found the desire to really look for someone who can make me feel as happy as I make them. My grandma died back in 03, I was in 3rd grade and as far as I knew it was a natural death. She had smoked a lot all her life and had really bad asthma. I always saw her using an inhaler. And the last time me and my brother hung out with her she brought us home early because she was feeling not so hot point about a week. Later, maybe less, my dad got a call and started bawling and natural I wondered what was up and found out she died. This was the first time anyone I knew had died. Obviously devastated point I remember though that it didn't end at her death. I remember going to courthouses with my parents, and one time a detective came by to ask questions to my mom. She said it was to make sure there was an unnatural cause of death. Foul's play, something along those lines, but translated into something I could understand that young point years down the road they always would bring up how there's certain things you don't know about your life, that when you're older you'll know, and it'll change your life. 
never out of nowhere always when there was some sort of deeper discussions about our lives one day my whole family got in a very emotional fight and I used my grandma's death to guilt my dad because he was usually the bad guy in all these fights. That's a whole other issue, though point he broke down and snapped and broke the truth that she was raped and murdered by an old friend of his who he had lost touch with. He had always had a hard life and it took the best of him from what my dad told me. And that one night he and some friends of his probably tweaked out decided to go raid my grandma's house for her pot plants, but ended up doing more than that. I remember it blowing my mind, being in shock, hearing the shock in my brother's voice and my mom just going no 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 do not say. That point turns out they had been advised not to tell us at such a young age what had really happened because, knowing details now, it was horrific point but looking back at everything it made perfect sense. And it was certainly something of a relief finally knowing this grand mystery I was told about. Even though I never remember it bearing on me that much. Maybe it did though. Not biggest, but it's a good one. I lived in an apartment building one year in undergrad with two roommates and practically a third roommate as it seemed. Like we had friends sleeping on our futon every other night. We had very eclectic distinguishable furnishings. For instance jazz posters, a fake palm tree on the wall, a nation style dining room table made out of a closet door and some cement forms, a jungle of plants, and a futon being held up with baling wire and log stumps. We never locked our place, because small town values. On one weekend, there is a huge drunken fest going on down the hallway. The next morning, the early riser rumor gets up, and finds some random guy sleeping on a log futon. He makes oatmeal and leaves to study, thinking it was yet another random friend. Second rumor gets up and either sees random guy and thinks nothing of it and leaves, or finds note random guy left for us, I forget which. I get up and find this note telling us he didn't know how he ended up on our futon, but thanking us for our hospitality and not calling the cops on him. He was with an out of town band and offered to get us into the performance. We ended up not being able to go. We ended up locking our door regularly after that. I thought that was the end of that point I don't know. Four years later I meet this cute guy at a friend's day party and we instantly hit it off. I know what you might be thinking right now, but it's not that big of a twist. We'd been together for a while when he shares this story about his mate waking up in a very odd apartment and starts describing the weird furnishings. It was us random guy's friend and I have been dating now for over 3 years, and I'm now friends with random guy and half of his old high school posse. I met a guy, settled down, and started to help him raise his kids. It was great, we all seemed to get along well, and we were planning our lives together 4 years into the relationship. His youngest daughter was 2 when I first met her, and 6 when it all went to hell. Point one morning there was a knock on the door. I heard my ex who was making pancakes in the kitchen with the kids, talking to someone, and then I hear, is there anyone else here, there's, one other guy in the back room. I'm getting my pants on and step out in the hallway, to see a guy I'd never seen before who was wearing a shirt marked, FBI. I walk into the living room, and see ICE agents, other FBI agents, and guys and gals in shirts, marked sheriff point turns out, while I was at work he was taking the kids home after school, and making kiddie born. The FBI got involved, because he had emailed a few of the photos to other countries. It was the first time I'd ever been subjected to a lie detector test, and it was the deep south, and I was some dude who had been living with another guy for 4 years. Needless to say his ex-wife got sole custody of the kids in the span of a day I lost my lover and the man I thought I would be spending my life with and my kids. We'd just moved to a brand new area and I couldn't live there alone after that, so I ended up moving in with my parents. I lost the car, I've not seen neither of my kids in 3 years, and he is in jail for a very long time point I've had to pick up the pieces of my life and move on without them. It was 4 years ago at age 26, and for better or worse, my life completely changed course forever. I lived in Cali as an engineer for a massive defense company. They pay quite a bit for that kind of thing. So I'm thinking I've got a pretty stable career lined up. Anyways I'm dating this girl for a bit, and she moved to Vietnam, as she had planned to do, before we even met. That's 12 time zones from my hometown in New York. 
We said our goodbyes, but kept in contact quite a bit point so anyways, I'm working a sheet ton of hours at work. This was Easter Sunday, and it was my 12th 12 hour day in a row, 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. I suddenly came down with a terrible illness. Big time chills and fever. The nature of the job had my waiting with nothing to do for 1 to 3 hours while I monitor testing, but really I just had to make sure it was them actually doing tests, and then I could check the results. QC stamp, done. So I got sick around 10 to 11 pm, and was the only one who could be there, and it was only a few more hours, and it was like over $70 slash HR, and I didn't want to let the company down, so I thought I'll just tough it out. Well as I'm suffering in my chills just trying to survive, I closed my eyes, to attempt to meditate my headache away. I was sitting up in my chair, but I must have dozed off for literally 20 to 30 seconds. So there was this girl on her first day on the job from the navy, who was present, just to make sure the testing is done QC on the navy's end basically. She tells her boss in her report, that I fell asleep for 30 seconds, but she didn't mention the rest of the story in my sickness or anything. The navy bossman tells the VP of this massive company about it, my boss is boss is boss or something, and I'm instantly fired without even telling my case or anything two weeks later I moved to Vietnam. I have been working in education as a teaching and curriculum developer. I tried it with that girl, but it didn't work out, and now I have a girl that is 2 to 3 numbers higher than me on the hotness scale, score. I travel all around S.E. Asia constantly, play soccer, my life's passion, with a whole host of international players, and get to travel to several cities a year with my team for tournaments. I'm going to Thailand in 2 weeks with 15 of my good buddies can't beat that. Have a rewarding job, where I work only 15 to 25 hours a week, and make about 10 times the local average per month, as opposed to work 84 hours a week back in the previous job, I'm loving the work, to live approach not wasting my life away, and I don't have any plans of leaving Asia anytime soon. Life is absolutely amazing, TLDR, had a life changing 30 second nap and I don't regret a thing. I've talked of this story before here but here is a bit of a longer version which is full of plot twists. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. My best friend B had a fianke who died. It was devastating. He had overdosed, no one even knew he was doing drugs. He was young 20 something. I practically moved in with her and slept on the living room couches together to keep her company as nights were the worst for her previously she had introduced me to a friend of hers and greatly encouraged me to date this guy s. I felt awkward dating him, because she had said, if I didn't have a boyfriend I would be dating this guy. I expressed concern of this being weird, and she insisted that he's a great guy and we should date. He was really fun, and we dated casually for a month or so before the K died. Four or five months after the death I got a job opportunity to work out of state. I took it. As I was cleaning, boxing things, general moving activities I kept calling the guy and friend to come help me. Things get heavy, and it's nice having a friend around to help. But my friend B and Guy S were nowhere around the last two weeks of me in that town. When I moved Guy S and friend B agreed to help drive me there, I had my car and a U-Haul. B recruited her brother to help with the caravan. It is a 10 hour drive, and it was going to be a fun time of switching company back and forth the cars on the way there. But brother got in my car and he rode with me for the whole 10 hours. First time meeting him. He was fun, but where were my other friends? Well, plot twist, yes, they had been dating the whole two weeks previous my trip and the actual trip was a mini vacation for them. When she confessed I told her that I forgave her and was glad she could move on, but wish the truth had come out sooner because it was hard for me to be alone for two weeks and wondered why I was with the brother for 10 hours when it was planned it would be a fun car hopping 10 hour trip. Anyway she decides to move to a different state with him. Plot twist the relationship does not go well, and it turns abusive. The job I had moved for was seasonal it was to help build my resume and network. So when my friend was in distress and my season was over I decided to move across the country with her to help her get out of this abusive relationship. She then introduced me to a coworker of hers. He was very cute, and we hit it off right away. I asked her if she liked him and that I would not continue if she had any feeling for him at all. She said no they had different personalities and she was not interested. 
I asked her if it would be okay to date him since I was there to help her in the first place and if that would be distracting or whatever to her staying away from guy s she said I needed to live my own life and do my own thing and she was happy that I was just there for her. Well the three of us became best friends the guy I was dating D and best friend B and me. We did everything together we explored our new state together we went out all the time together. I was having a really hard time finding a professional job as this was 09 and took 3 side jobs. This kept me busy 7 days a week. They continue the party without me but of course I never suspected anything. So when my grandfather whom I was very close to was dying I was thinking of nothing else when I flew home to him. I was very lucky to see him and even have one more conversation with him before he passed. He was a World War II vet from the greatest generation. He is the definition of the greatest generation. He was 95 years old, still had a valid driver's license that he tested for every year. He shoveled his own snow. He took care of my grandmother who was sick. He could do everything and was a very healthy individual. When he came down with pneumonia he unfortunately is not treated quickly enough and started having heart complications. I was very devastated and it came as a big shock because his health level was very good. It was my first grandparent to pass away. I was very upset. We are a close family. I grew up with him in my same hometown. When I came back home, they both came to pick me up from the airport. There was a strange vibe in the car that I cannot put my finger on but was too upset to notice. That night D and I got into a big fight. He was upset I would not have sex with him. I said I was too upset and now I'm thinking of papa looking down on me from heaven. It will take a while for me to get back to myself. He said, well it's unfair for me to have to walk on eggshells around you. Is this going to last 10 years? What the hell does any of that mean? We broke up that night. My friend oddly enough took his side and said how can you not know a 95 year old man could die. I couldn't imagine anybody saying that to anyone. I would never say that to anyone. The funeral was less than a week ago. All he wanted to do was talk about stories of how I remembered him and why he's so special and to keep his story and him alive. Our friendship ended that day but was not sealed until I found out that she was now dating D. I found out because she took a trip to Las Vegas huked up with an old high school friend. Came back to D and lead to him and said she only kissed the guy but it was okay because she was drunk and she was sorry. He said that's the same story we told me and we were dating then. D called me and told me the whole story while I was on my way to pick up two elementary girls that I tutored. I had to hear everything confirmed and pull myself together immediately to tutor these girls for two hours. Well turns out she was dating the high school huck up. She would call him in secret every day and talk about how much she liked him and about how much she missed him and then go back to D at night. Before he found out point they ended up getting engaged, she moved back to our home state. And now she married the high school huck up guy. I'm the only one who knows that. That marriage started as her cheating on her boyfriend who was previously my boyfriend. I hope her kids are obsessed with asking the story of how they met. And that will always be in the back of her mind. Just graduated from university and had been out celebrating into the early hours. Me and a mate had decided at 6am to take a walk to a shop to get some munch. On the way we passed a student house that I had lived in a few years previous. Back then I had gotten a spare key cut for it which I still had in my possession sheet faced. We decided it would be funny slash nostalgic to go in and take a look about. The house was split into two apartments that shared a hallway on the way in. As we walked upstairs towards my old apartment my mate clocked a pile of mail that nobody in the building had cleaned, all probably addressed to previous tenants. We sifted through the pile and found a few that were addressed to me and sat them aside. We then continued up the stairs and made our way into the apartment. Since it was the end of the semester, most students had gone home for the summer and the apartment was empty. Admittedly we didn't know that when we went in. So we explored my old digs, took some photos and videos as proof to show mates, and rummaged for any items of value left behind by the previous occupants. It was not a bad haul, we found a blue box that we were able to fill with leftover bottles of beer and see idea, some sweets, and random trinkets. 
We left the building, and on the way out I popped my mail into the blue box too. By this time now it was broad daylight and we were becoming less and less inebriated every minute. We stood at a street corner for 20 minutes, drinking our free booze, smoking a spliff, and chatting about the randomness of what had just happened. We then parted ways, and I made a shameful walk home, carting a large box of stolen goods. It was about 8am by the time I got back to my place, I sat on the couch, cracked open a beer, and started opening the mail addressed to me. I opened the first letter and figures immediately caught my eye, it was a tax rebate for around 500 pounds, I worked whilst I was studying, and had no idea I had been paying too much tax. The tax rebate letter had been delivered about 2 years ago, I opened the next letter, another rebate for 1200 pounds. So I continued to open the other letters, and by the end I had accrued around 2500 pounds in tax rebates. Good haul indeed. My mate was very envious when he heard, and was trying to work out if he was entitled to any of my rebate. We still laugh about it now, and how the moral of the story should have been that drunk breaking and entering was a bad thing, but in this case it was the best decision we could have made. Reposting my story from a past thread point I grew up for the first 12 years of my life convinced that my dad was my biological dad. Well sheet, turns out he's not. But that didn't matter, he's still my dad, I'm still his son. That didn't change anything. My actual biological dad is a junkie, I'd rather have my dad as a dad than that junkie ho. Edit, just a clarification, my mother and dad were separated at the time. My parents had already had two children, my two older sisters. My biological dad denies anything about me, except for the fact that he signed my original birth certificate. We've actually contacted us paternity court about this and they actually wanted us to go down there and do our story for the show couldn't afford the trip though my parents are wonderful people so don't assume that oh uh, mom's a hoe iq guys have most likely faked my mother many times just because i'm op doesn't make her a hoe pls edit 2 we simply refer to my biological dad as my sperm donor and as of now He's literally denied that he's my dad, and his other son denies me as a brother. His parents deny me, all the people my mother's contacted deny that I'm related to them. Except for the fact that it now. He signed my birth certificate, I look just like him, he's the only person my mother was with at the time. Outperforming on my old job, twice, and being let go because I just didn't get it the requirement was I needed to bring in 5k a month in brokerage. I proved that I did. Then they said, well, you need to be in 5k a month in Deutschmarks, alone. I proved that I did, on average over a 10 month period, and in fact I was bringing in 8k a month in total brokerage overall. Also, I had a relationship with the head proprietary currency swap trader at JP Morgan at the time. They fired me, because I just didn't get it. Then, not allowing to be pout down by this, I got another job, but not in the front space, but in the back office so be it, and hearing on my current job, that employees were awarded for performance. I outperformed, there there was another that did not do the job, and ended up sleeping at his desk, he got promoted, twice. There is a god, however, for 12 years later, he was ordered not to show up, to work the next day as a result of being discovered for violations he had done, prior to getting this job. Normally VPs have to give a month's notice, his was such, that he was ordered, not to show up the next day, and then I come to learn, that this performance data, was never looked at, by anyone, for 15 years. I started to, and am making more efficiencies. But, I'm still waiting for the proportions to come in, like in a manner, that would have affected me when younger and appropriate. I may not have become so fat, may have been made more confident in salary increases when young, may have gotten married as a result and had kids, allowing the scholarship I learned about in my 30s at an exclusive private high school to possibly benefit my kids. The scholarship then created, was any family member of an alumni can go for free this high school charges 40, 50k. A year would have been a nice thing to happen accidentally, and at the right time, had the right thing been done for me, back then. I'm still waiting. Seeing that God provides, I shame myself in playing the lottery, regularly, as a means to perhaps get, this, 
to me while I'm still somewhat young at 51. It is an exercise in hope, don't judge. I also have a meager stock account, where I put in the excess. When I quit smoking, I decided to apply a thirds of the money I used to smoke, on lottery. I'm late to the party but here's mine. Knew this girl from high school. We used to be fairly close. I would find refuge in her house as a teen. We went through our young crazy days together as young adults and we did drugs together for about 2 or 3 years. She worked with me at 3 different jobs and even lived with me briefly. As we grew up, I straightened out and she fell deeper into the drugs. This caused me to stop hanging out with her because she was still living very crazily and she was a threat to all the good things I had going for me. We still talked though. One October she comes over after not seeing her for almost a year and she brings this cute guy she's dating with her. He looked familiar and it turns out he went to school with us. He had long hair and HS and had cut it since then. We drink and my friend Rob and I sing some songs we've been writing to them. It was a good time. A month later, on the weekend after Thanksgiving her boyfriend starts texting me saying that he had come back into state from visiting his family and his girlfriend my friend is Myra and his cats had been left with no food or water. We both assume that she's on another drug bender and we text each other regularly through the weekend looking for her. At one point I said, if she doesn't stop this sheet, she won't be alive to see 23. Little did we know until later, that night that she was already dead. She had oded point there are two things about this that strike me. About two months after her death, her boyfriend and I found ourselves together. It was never intentional. He hadn't dated her for more than eight months, but he had been friends with her for almost as long as I had. We bonded over our grief in losing her. What's crazy to me is that we grew up in a very small town with a high school of maybe 400 students put together, and he had to be one of maybe five total students that I saw on a regular basis, but never talked to and by this weird horrible twist of fate, I found the most amazing man, and he had been right in front of me the whole time. I never would have thought that someone I saw and overlooked for 4 years would be the man I married. I wish I had talked to him sooner in high school. I like to think our friend knew what she was doing when she introduced us to each other one month before her death, after I hadn't seen her in so long. Like a final gift before she left this planet. The other thing that really sticks with me though is that one of the songs we sang to them, my friend there at the time, was a rapper and I did chorus, was about living shady and letting drugs take control of you and even overdosing, but keeping hope in your heart and aiming to do better despite being in such a bad place and during it, she sat on my couch and cried profusely. That image will always haunt me since it was the last time I saw her before she died. She wanted to be better, but it got to her first. Was called into the production boss's office two months ago. He is a pretty intense guy, and just came by my desk and said, Xnoopixx, I need to talk to you in my office. I'll be waiting. I am running through crap in my mind it may be about. My department boss had been throwing me under the bus to cover himself the last couple of months. That's probably it. So, I start preparing my defense and gather proof to illustrate where I'm actually doing a good job. Prepare to beg for my job. I'm a single dad and my daughter depends on me. Point I go to his office. He has a stern look on his face and says, shut the door and have a seat. Crap. He then says, I had a meeting this morning and before that meeting I was working on a project. I reply with, yes it. He then says, when I came out of that meeting, the project was completed, and I heard you did it. I said, yes he goes on to say, I didn't ask you to do that, but I appreciate the initiative, and we need more people, like you running this place, how would you feel about taking on the mailing debt? This department makes up 50% of the company's annual revenue. I still don't grasp what he is saying, so I start my defense, you. No, every time you have asked me to do something, I have always completed it within the expected time with expected quality or better than expected. He then says, I don't think you understand what I'm asking. Would you be interested in a management position over the mailing department? I was floored and couldn't grasp it. The following day I followed up with a conversation asking if he was still serious about that meeting. He said, I know it is a lot to ask and you will be compensated accordingly. 
The number you told me you would do it for was much lower than what you should have asked for, so I helped you out on that. We will start training next month. I still won't believe it till it happens, but I'm already being included in management meetings. TLDR thought I was getting fired and got the biggest promotion of my life. Literally, it will change the quality of my life. Decide to move to Vancouver in April to escape family and heal mental slash emotional issues. Partner is distraught, will not move with me, but wants to stay with me to offer support for the 5 months until I leave. Odd, but 4 year relationship and amazing friendship, I couldn't be happier starts hanging out with known manipulative friend, said friend convinces her I'm the devil. Partner moves in with friend 2 days, after telling me she's sticking around in the chance I change my mind, and want to stay with her. When I was told her decision, I offered to stay in our province, but move citizen to 10 therapy, a good compromise, if she'd stay with me, as these events opened my eyes to the fact, that in order to get help I'm sacrificing the one thing in life I actually care about. She declines it's been a week since she moved, I'm living in a sheet hole with 5 guys, all on welfare, I'm the only employed person, and she's in the clutches of this conniving, when Chu just wants to sleep with her. All of our mutual friends can see the manipulation, but partner is blind to it. Currently tapping on her window trying to wake her, but not the friend, because today we're packing up the rest of our old place, but she's drinking heavily every day off of work, because this house is a party house, and I'm worried for her safety. Slippery slope. My would have been fiancé, common law partner of 3 years, was killed on the job the day he was going to buy my engagement ring. He never told me that he was going to buy it then, but that was the day that his paycheck would have cleared, and he was so nervous and anxious about all of the errands that he had to complete that day. He was also a DJ and a VJ, and told me he did not have any bookings for New Year's. He said he didn't want to take any, and he just wanted to have a lovely evening with me that day. The accident happened on December 6, 2012. Point we were contracted drivers, driving children to school in a rural part of Canada. He decided to take the route that I had previously drove the year before, because I did not want to deal with one of the families. There was a huge snowstorm the day before. The difficult family that I did not want to deal with again had their children stay in the city with the father, but did not tell us this. When he drove to the first house and there was no children, he went on to the second house. In going from the first to the second house, a fox ran out in front of him, and he lost control. It was a single lane highway, and a large truck, the square kind used for moving, the word escapes me now, was traveling in the opposite lane. He was t-boned on the passenger side, and was killed instantly from blunt force trauma to the head point this was the only day that the difficult family did not bother to call us to tell us they wouldn't need a ride. This was the only day in 4 years of driving that this happened. Every other day there would have been 3 children in the van with him. Luckily, he was alone that day point it's been nearly 3 years. I have since buried my best friend and love of my life, relapsed into addiction. Sobered up, moved to another city, went back to school to get a master's degree, and started dating again. Points TLDR. Partner died in a workplace tragedy at Christmas time. Be kind to your partners, and really, everyone. You never know. I've told this story enough to know it should be prefaced with he's fine now. Point so my dad had a heart attack, and I was going to technical college at the time. This is about 2 years ago, I got the call in class that he was in the hospital. I had to leave then and there. I'd been raised not to give any more than is necessary, especially when it came to family affairs, so I told the substitute teacher that I need to leave. It's personal. I just need to go right now. I'm told that, without a proper explanation I would get an absence marked for the afternoon. I didn't care. I was already gone point fast forward about 2 weeks. I haven't been in class due to hospital visits and watching my dad's house, but I'm there now. And my teacher is there today. Point we had to hand in some papers for a competition I was participating in. So when I go up, he stops me. He says, clearly with thoughts of his own, what is your plan for next year? Oh, ick now. Continue on to university, maybe do some more schooling. Definitely find a job in it. I am nervous as hell when he gives me a sideways look. Can I talk to you in my office? I 
think it is worth mentioning at this point that I was going to one of those schools with an absenteeism clause that states they can kick you out of a course at any point with no refund after you've missed 14 classes. After 7, you get a warning. On top of this, there are 5 classes in a day, 5 days a week. I've been gone for 2 weeks. So, doing this math in my head, while pretending to be nonchalant, I realize I'm 3.57, multiplied by faked point we sit down in his office, and try to make a joke or two, unsuccessfully point my teacher starts talking about the class, the overload of students in it, and the amount of work he has to do to teach them what they need to know. It's hard enough as it is, and next year his teaching assistant is moving up in the division point okay, I get it. He's kind of rambling, but he's saying that I'll need to apply for next year's course soon, if I want it, because I'm going to have to repeat, and they are going to have less space. I'm not even going to try and argue this, but it's killing me that he's dropping this bomb so slowly point he's saying this is a great opportunity for teacher's assistant. She's moving up into it, and we are really happy for her, that's really great, I offer, but what exactly was it you wanted to talk to me about? Well, about my educational assistant. With her gone, I need someone to take her place, right, do. You want to work here next year, I gave him kind of a dumb look at that point, and he threw in, I know you want to go to school next year, and that's great, I encourage you to if you can't do this, we'll find someone. Take your time with the decision. It's a big one. I became the king of articulation at that point. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Great. Thanks you. UMM. I'll just take the end of the year. Uh. I'll let you know by the end of the day. Thanks, TLDR. Set myself to get kicked out of school. Got offered money to help teach there instead. 